Please be so kind as to introduce yourself and where you're calling from. Salamu alaikum from Instructor Benjamin Bilal. Khalil Sultan, Atlanta, Georgia. Salamu alaikum, Muhammad Ali Mali, El Sabrante, California, San Francisco. Salamu alaikum, Winona Majid, Southern California. Salamu alaikum, Sahib Mujahid, Bakersfield, California. Salamu alaikum, Kareem Abdul Salam, Memphis, Tennessee. Diane Cleveland, Ohio. Brother Fahim, Riverdale, Georgia. Assalamu alaikum. Jesse, North Carolina. Assalamu alaikum. Ezekiel Abdullah, Atlanta, Georgia. Let's keep those introductions coming. If you haven't introduced yourself, give us your name and where you're calling from, please. This is Roll Call. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. Salim Mohammed Charlotte, North Carolina. Salam alaikum. Senior Executive Instructor Bayina Hamid, Augusta, Georgia. Alaikum salam. Let's keep it coming. Adia Ansari from Rex, Georgia. There we go. I heard oh, it. Good to see you. It works. Okay. It works. Indeed. <laughs> it's great to see you. <laughs> Thank you. I've been trying. I've been having problems. Well, nothing beats a failure but a try, eh? Thank you. Thank you. You got it. You got it. Salam alaikum. Alaikum salam, soldier. Yes, sir. Robert Don, good battle to everybody and welcome to be amongst the family and info. Indeed. All it's right. Out of sight, soldier. Indeed. Salam alaikum, Sherry and Ronnie, willing barrel the journey. All right. You batting a thousand. I'm seeing you in every class now. <laughs> you have an issue, though, with your clarity in your, in your uh, camera. I still do. I, I can't figure out what's going on. I've tried. Right, to... Don't worry about it. I just wanted to make sure you knew about it because the first time you were chiming in with us, you were crystal clear. I, I want you to get back to that crystal clear picture. Okay. I'll see All what right. I can do about that. <laughs> okay. In the meantime, anyone else before we get started? We got a lot for you tonight. Hello, it's Jennifer Hall from Cleveland, hey. Ohio. Hey, Jennifer Hall from Cleveland, Ohio. How are you? Hi. Always oh, great to see your bright, smiling face and camera. <laughs> great, great, great. Thank you. All right. Who else do we have who have not introduced themselves? Kareem Safir, Atlanta GA. There he goes. You had me wondering. I was about to send the squad out for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. So I'm going to ask you to just take over for the next two to three minutes, and I'll be ready to start in about three minutes. As soon as you see my picture, you know I'm ready to start. Okay, we will do. Okay. All right, keep it coming, please. Those of you who have not introduced yourself, please do so. And where are you calling from? Mama Lekou, this is Sister Habiba Abdul Shahi calling from Camden, New Jersey, senior instructor, senior instructor, excuse me. And everybody's having a beautiful day today. As well, Alaikum Salam, Habiba. How are you? Alhamdulillah, I'm doing well. Thank good. you. Good. How the hell's everything going for you today? Good, good, good. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. All right, all right. That's what I need to hear. All the good news I can get. <laughs> <laughs> right, introduce yourself, please. Those of you who have not done so yet, and where are you calling from? Assalamualaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Ramzadeen Amik. Ramzadeen, how are you, my brother? Oh, fine. I'm alive. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm delighted. Great. Um, All right. Keep it coming, please. Announce yourself and where you're calling from. Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Amin Sharif, Charlotte, North Carolina. Amin, Amin. How are you, my brother? Doing well. Alhamdulillah. How about you, Wade? Good, 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 good. good. Alhamdulillah. Grandbabies. Oh, Got those grandbabies with you today? No, sir. No, sir. All right. All right. Alhamdulillah. All right. Keep it coming now. Uh, announce yourself if you haven't done so yet. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This is the senior executive instructor, Imam Adib Abdullah, signing in from Wales, Philadelphia. <laughs> <laughs> love y'all, man. Straight yeah. up. Yes, yeah, sir. I love you, brother. Wa alaikum salam. Good to see you, man. Same here. Well, I don't see you yet, but good to see your name anyway. There you go. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> I can let you get away with that, bro. <laughs> I haven't had a chance to read your uh, your kutba yet. I sure intend to, though. 
Yeah. I may chime in. It was it was yeah. excellent, but it was yeah. excellent. But. Alhamdulillah, I know it was, man. I just haven't read it yet. I, I like that kind of busy, though, you know. Yes, yes, sir. Without a doubt. Yes, sir. If you haven't introduced yourself, please do so. Uh, National instructor will be with us in just a few moments. No, I am with you right now. All right, alhamdulillah. Uh, okay. <laughs> it's not up on you. All right. All right, we're ready to go. All right, all of you put your seat belts on tonight for this one. We are about to deliver. I'm going to be going over some rocky territory. But like Rocky in the movies, I will be victorious. <laughs> this is such a beautiful journey that Allah has embarked us upon. And I am thankful every conscious moment of the day for what Allah is not only doing for myself, but for all of us through this gift that he has given to us called the Nunetics. And I'm looking at the names here, I believe everyone here has been introduced to this linguistic technology, as my wife likes to call it, called the Nunetics, the identification of every Arabic letter and what it means as a part of nature, beginning with the nature of your own body. So we're able to identify every Arabic letter as a part of the body, not to mention things outside of us. And all we have to do then is seriously study the thing that the letter is pointing to, to get deeper insight into what the words that those letters are comprising are actually saying on a level far above and beyond what the dictionaries give us. Isn't that it's really like compensation for slavery for, for, for some of us, <laughs> for slavery and Jim Crow. I mean, I, I can't think of a better gift that Allah could give us. And I mean, it's going to be more significant for our future than it is for our present. And by future, I mean, just wait around for the rest of this year. You're going to see some miracles come out of Nunetics. You don't have to wait two or three years or after you die, it'll happen. I believe that Allah is going to allow this thing to spring forth and sprout and we're gonna see at least the initial fruit if you labor hard to establish the Nunetics method. You need to be bringing your children and your grandchildren here right about now. Some people actually are, and other people are actually late. And the people who are late the most are the ones who've been here the longest, <laughs> hint, hint. You notice I didn't look at the camera when I said that to you, right? Because this represents your second chance. So I think, okay, we're going to close the door for a moment. I'll still be letting people in along the way. But I am your instructor, your international instructor, Benjamin Bilal. And uh, we're going to be embarking upon a continuation, actually, of the subject dealing with Ramadan. And uh, if you let me bring my notes up here, we'll see the exact title of today's discourse. You're going to enjoy this. I've entitled it Ramadan colon, frequency, energy, and vibration. Get a load of that title. Ramadan, frequency, energy, and vibration. All right, so let me pull my notes back up and get us on track, inshallah. Thank all of you for your patience. As mentioned earlier, the uh, subject for today is Ramadan, Frequency, energy, and vibration. I am your international instructor, Benjamin Bilal. We're here on this Sunday, March 26, 2023. We want to begin with some quotations from some very famous people who work with energy medicine. The first one is Bruce Lipton, who many of you have heard of. If you have not heard of these people, you need to write their names down and you need to Google them as soon as we hang up from this webinar, because these are very, very essential people in terms of their knowledge for what we need to know in 2023 and beyond. So Mr. Bruce Lipton said that every cell in your body is a battery, a battery. And Dr. Joe Dispenza, one of his running buddies, he said, according to the quantum model of reality, we could say that all diseases is a lower ring of frequency. Think about that. All diseases are a lower ring of frequencies. That's exactly what disease actually is. A lower ring of frequency. And we've been discussing frequency in the last two to three classes uh, leading up to Ramadan. 
That's Dr. Joe Dispenza. If you're on the phone, it's D-I-S-P-E-N-Z-A. Hippocrates said that the natural healing force within us is the greatest force in getting well. He didn't say popping a pill. He didn't say taking a jab. Hippocrates, the father of medicine, according to this world, said that the natural healing force within us, meaning the fitra-based healing force in our language, is the greatest force in getting well. And Mehmet Oz, MD, who's very famous today, uh, television host of his own show, et cetera. I think Oprah Winfrey got him started and he kind of got very popular under her tutelage. He said that the next frontier, the next big frontier in medicine is energy medicine. Now, many of you, maybe most of you have not heard of energy medicine. And I'm sure that many of the people who are establishing the so-called new world ideas regarding medicine are people who some way, somehow are tapped into the wisdom of the Quran. Especially as the Quran discusses that all important word that I introduced to you from the actual verse that speaks on Ramadan, the word Furqan. I believe that's where they get the English word frequent and frequency, Furqan, the exact same consonantal connections. And even if not, Allah is still in control and Allah is moving the world in the direction of the Quran, but not that Quran that we've been sold through the average masjid or through the average uh, Muslim scholar, ulima, mufti, imam, not that Islam. We're talking about a return to the fitra based proposal designed by the source creator himself, Allah, and given not to a race, not to an ethnicity, not to a gender, not to an age category, you know, only those between 17 and 40 can benefit from this book. No, 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 no. Allah said that it is for anas. What does anas mean? It's an Arabic term that means the people. It is for all people who identify as people. And you know, if you listen to that term and nas, that word nas kind of consonantally connects with the English word nice. So I like to say that and nas represents that they represent the nice people. You know, the people who are trying to do the right thing, trying to act right, be right, treat other people nicely. Yeah. So the nice people are and nas. Sometimes they do some crazy stuff though, according to the Quran. But on the most part, the default setting for and nas as Allah created humanity to operate, the default setting is niceness, civility, and inquisitiveness. That's the main component within the brains of people who are in that category that Allah calls and nas. They are very, very curious people. And you know, when you're curious, they say that you're sticking your nose into things, right? That's what they say curious people do. Why are you sticking your nose all the way over here into my business? I'm curious about what you're talking about. That's why. So look at the English word nose. Compare it consonantally with the Arabic word nas. See? Nas, nose. Nosy people, that's also a part of Anas. Who are the nosiest people on this planet? Young children. But we don't call it nosy when they start asking us questions. We just call it curiosity. They don't know. They just got here. They're asking a lot of questions. They see you doing stuff that doesn't make sense. So they're asking questions. Mommy, mommy, you know. Why that man say that? Man still standing there. <laughs> so choosing the innocent, they don't. Why that man say that? He scared me when he said that. Oh, no, child, there's your uncle uh, Bobo. No, Bobo's always talking at the top of his lungs like that. He don't mean no harm. He talks, talks with a very loud voice. Well, he's scaring me. My, you know, the children are curious about why, what, when, where, how. That's how human life is established, according to Allah's fitra. It's so beautiful when you understand it. So that's Anas, keep that in mind. And the Quran was revealed, according to the Quran, as guidance 
to Anas. And as Furqan, discrimination. In other words, it's revealed in order for humans, true humans, to be able to reset their frequency default system. Your frequency default system. And default is exactly what the word says. D means to take away. Fault. If you utilize the remedy called Ramadan, you get it? It's going to help you erase the blackboard on all of those faults and sins and mistakes and misgivings and bad attitudes and emotional issues that you've been having. It's going to cause you to be able to erase that board, clean that window so that you can see yourself in it again and you can see those outside of the window. That's what Ramadan does. It's a cleansing agent for the human life. So you heard what the father of medicine had to say about the natural healing force within you. And Mehmed Oz, you heard what he had to say about the next big frontier in medicine as energy medicine. Let's continue. Now, Allah has installed a system for healing which operates from within the body without the need for any intrusive measures having to take place. And intrusive measures include syringes that come from out here and have to be uh, forced to, to penetrate your skin. So that's an unnatural remedy. If it has to be forced into your bloodstream, that by itself is anti-fitra. If it's coming in the form of a pill that is chemicals put together in a laboratory, that's also not good. Sometimes what's in the pill will be good, but what the coating of the pill is made of can even be haram for those of us who understand that word. See? So uh, surgeries, you know, they have to cut you open to save your life, or they have to cut you open to get you better or to remove a, a, a diseased part of the body. As valuable as surgeries have been, are, and probably will continue to be, it's still an intrusive message that is not necessarily a pattern or a thing that the fitra represent, uh, recognizes as being fitra-based. Because in the fitra, Allah doesn't get anything well by cutting it open and taking stuff out, throwing it away. <laughs> We're entering into a new era of discovery. And the Quran is going to be center place. It's going to eventually be the central focus for all awake minds, not woke minds, awake minds. And you look at even the word awake. I told you about the a privative. So woke and wake in and of themselves doesn't really say anything complimentary about the human life because awake means not wake if i awoke that means i'm not woke so what is awake if you've ever been to a funeral <laughs> you know what awake is <laughs> it's a celebration of the dead you don't want to be that. You want to be awake, not woke. I hope I'm breaking down some mysteries right from the beginning of this discourse that you can use. We call it news that you can use. So Allah himself has installed a system for healing, which operates firstly from within the body without the need for any intrusion such as syringes, such as pills, and such as surgeries even, unless the surgery is absolutely necessary to save life, then we can go with that. That's an advancement in science and in technology. We understand that. But energy healing happens from within. There are so many fascinating properties that Allah has created the human being to operate upon, but modern day Western psychology and medicine and a lot of the things that we're dealing with that we think are the top of the line uh, solutions for health and staying healthy. A lot of these things really, if you understand what other people have been dealing with, especially in the ancient world, 
you'll understand that a lot of what we're doing is still considered to be primitive by those people who actually have advanced knowledge of medicine and science, such as in China, such as many places in India. They have healing modalities that do not involve sticking you with a needle. It does not involve trying to go in and snatch something out of your body. It does not involve these kinds of things. Some of them are so masterful in their techniques that they know how to send actual frequency energy from their hands without even touching your physical body. They can send frequencies from their hand into your chest, into your torso, and begin to rearrange the molecules and the cellular structure, kill off the dead cells, enliven the living cells. And all of a sudden, what you would normally call surgery here, fixing of something that went wrong in your torso, energy medicine, and people who are healers for real, for real, know how to do that by the flow and distribution of energy that comes right from their body because your body is surrounded itself by energy fields. You heard them as your aura. You heard them as your Taurus field. These are fields of energy that actually protrude about six feet out from your body. That's still your body. That's your etheric body. See, that's your Taurus field body. That's why you can feel most of the time if somebody comes in the room and you don't hear them come in, but when they get that close to you, about six feet or so, you feel them and you turn around. So, oh man, I felt like somebody was in the room. See, we say that and we do that all of the time, not realizing that we're actually responding to our other or to at least our extended body, which is also part and parcel of matter created by Allah. Allah in the Quran says, Laqad khalaqnal insana fi asani taqweed. That for sure, for sure, we have created the human being in the most excellent of organizational designs. See? He didn't just say I created you as a fleshly beast body and left you there and left you like that. No, Allah says that he has power packed this human life to the point and to the level where the human being now in science is seen as the most sophisticated life form in anywhere you can look for on this planet, at least. We don't know about the rest of the universe yet. But we do know that on this planet, the human being is king of the hill and shouldn't be arrogant about it. And it doesn't mean you're supposed to disrespect other life forms. Allah has placed us with this responsibility that includes being the caretaker of all other living things on this planet. That's the beauty in this. Now, ancient societies around the world, they knew this about the energy healing. But this knowledge has been intentionally suppressed in favor of the prophet Muhiv, which got its jump start in an ancient city named Medes. M-E-D-E-S, Medes, a name which eventually gave us the terms medicine and media, because the Medes were citizens of the city called media. So let's read a little bit about them. Media is actually named after a famous sorceress, the daughter of the king of Colchis, from Latin media, M-E-D-E-A, which is from a Greek word, which literally means cunning. And it's related to some other words that mean to deliberate, to estimate, to contrive, to decide, to protect, to rule over, see? And the prefix med means to take appropriate measures. That's media. And you remember now, Amongst the so-called African-American culture, they made a very famous person more famous by introducing him to the world as a her and called Medea. These things are plays on all of these ancient concepts. When these writers go to writing, they're including their knowledge of uh, scripture, they're including their knowledge of symbolism, mythology, and all of these other ologies. 
and they put it in a form that the average person can't decipher. It's just entertainment to you, but for them and their children and their grandchildren who are sitting in the same theater behind you, all the way up in the last row, taking notes, it's not just comedy to them. They understand what's being said about your people. <laughs> when they see Medea, the gunslinging Medea, they understand what it's saying about your people. And that's without me getting into any of the details. You'll have to study these things for yourself. There's also the word pharmacy. Where did this word pharmacy come from? Pharmacy is considered to be a medicine from the word pharmacy, a medicine that rids the body of an excess of humors. The body is seen as having four basic humors. Study that. And one of those humors is blood. There's phlegm, there's some other, there's that, that, that. So the body is seen as having four humors. So medicine is considered to be that which rids the body of an excess of humors, except for the blood. It leaves the blood intact. Also, the word pharmacy is based on an idea that uh, deals with the treatment with medicine. Theory of treatment with medicine, that's from the old French word that represents a purgative, a purging of things from the body that it wants to get rid of. And it's directly from the medieval, medieval, medieval Latin pharmacia, which is from the Greek word pharmakia, a healing or harmful medicine. Is this dictionary saying what I think it's saying? that the word pharmacia, which gives us the word pharmacy, is from a word that means a healing or harmful medicine. I mean to tell me it can be either or. It also means a healing or a poisonous herb, a drug, a poisonous potion, a magic potion, a dye, raw material for physical or chemical processing. So I would just ask you to be more careful when you go to the farm to the pharmaceutical people, the pharmacy. I'd be more careful. And it's not that they're doing anything intentionally to harm anybody. No, they're in it for noble reasons. They want to help humanity, et cetera. But the people at the top of the food chain, they have different ideas about humanity. And they will lace their medicines as they lace their food with stuff that can harm you and even kill you in time. So just to be careful, understanding the history of these, term these terminologies. So this is from Pharmakias, which is a preparer of drugs, a poisonous, a pardon me, a poisoner, a sorcerer. This is dealing with magic, juju stuff. <laughs> and it also represents a drug, a poison, a filter, a charm, a spell. Hmm? Remember that song, Natural High? Take to the sky on a natural high, high. He said, you know, fill me with all of your charm. See, you think they're just talking regular talk. The singer is because he has no clue what that means. See? A lot of terminology in the English language that is meant to, to spellbind us. The first discipline they teach us in school is spelling. And that's a term in witchcraft, isn't it? Witches brew. And I think those who spoke Hebrew, they understood what witches brew was because they understand brew. They give it to you as a brewski. Nothing but chemicals. All right, so that's enough of that. You get the gist of where pharmacy is coming from. Now, what does the Bible say about pharmakia? There's no sense that scripture uses terms such as pharmakia in reference to supernatural powers. That's what some people have said. They said there's no proof of that. Instead, biblical sorcery seems to be about abusing drugs for idolatry, recreation, and or oppression of others. So this is also behind the meaning of pharmakia which gives us the modern day word pharmacy and pharmaceuticals. 
Now, in ancient days, people were born, they would age, and then they would die. Birth, life, death. That's the cycle that was present, especially in the olden days, the ancient days of humans before pharmaceuticals became the go-to thing for ridding yourself of some ailment. The people were living close to nature, with nature. They were using nature as their medicine. See, they were using natural modalities for healing, natural foods that they would go into the woods sometime and snatch up some weeds because they knew that those weeds were good for curing this particular ailment. So because of that, they would be born regularly. They would grow up on the most part regularly. When they got sick, if they got sick, they'd find something in the field, they'd pull it off. Your grandmama used to do that if you're old enough, like I am, to remember that my grandmother would go in her backyard and get us stuff to fix a, a cold or something or some ailment. Sometimes they find something to rub on your sore or whatever, and the thing, you know, the pain go away and all of the mark and everything disappeared. They, but in modern days, we are born, we age, we get sick, and then we die. You see the difference? Olden days, we were born, we live, we die. Modern days, we are born, we age, we get sick, and then we die most of the time because of the sickness, not because of the aging. The sickness, which is called disease, is in the cells, in the cells, and is created by blockages in our cellular structure. That's what all sicknesses are, blockages in our cellular structure. If the cells do not become jammed up, blocked, then more than likely that illness is not going to spread around the body, across the, it has to run into some cells at some point, no matter where it started. So the cell is the determining factor, just like Imam Muhammad said about food. He said there's nutrition in the food, but what's calling for the food in the fitra of your body? He said, it's not your eyes that see the food and start salivating at the tongue. <laughs> I ain't had that kind of pie in a long time. <laughs> yeah. They start thinking about it on their way to grandma's house. She's going to have that peach pie and she, she at Christmas. I'm going to be sure I'm there. And I know I'm Muslim, but a good God of mine, I'm going to be at her house on December 25th. <laughs> Thank Jesus. So I can get me some of that peach pie. <laughs> I'm messing with y'all. And y'all know it, so I can get away with that. Now, it's not your eyes that want the food. You pick up the food with your hand, but it's not your hand that wants the food. You put the food in your mouth on your actual tongue and you start tasting the food, but it's not your tongue that wanted the food. This is all Imam Muhammad's logic. It's not your tongue. It goes down the gullet, goes down the throat, but it's not your throat that wants the food. The throat keeps pushing it down. I don't even need to stay here. You'll choke. Then it finally gets into the stomach. And it's still not the stomach per se that called for the food. What happens once it reaches the stomach and those acidic juices and the juices begin to break that food down into liquid, it's the liquid that then becomes distributed as nutrition into the cellular body, into your body's cells. See how beautiful that is as Allah created it? In the most excellent organizational design, the human being. So when we get sick, it's because of an interruption in the functionality of the cells themselves. Blockages, they're called. Hippocrates also said that if there's a way to heat the bones, then all diseases can be treated. Hippocrates, the father of Western medicine. If there's a way, listen to what he's saying now. We're talking about Ramadan, which has to do with heat, intense heat. If there's a way to heat the bones, then all diseases can be treated. And you know, the bones contain marrow, and they say that marrow is what's actually responsible for the development of blood. And it's the blood that wants the nutrition.
He said that if you can eat the bones, then all diseases, no matter where you find them, can be treated. Didn't necessarily say resolved, right? But at least they can be treated. This was budding science and the intellect of a man a few hundred years ago that understood what many doctors and medicine people today have no clue about. Albert Einstein, you've heard of him. He stated that future medicines will be the medicine of frequencies. Have you ever heard them teach you that in your college course on Einstein? No, more than likely. Because this kind of knowledge is the kind of knowledge that they want to keep away from the masses of people who would hear these things and ask about them, especially when somebody as uh, profound as Albert Einstein says it. E equals MC squared. Yeah, I'm going to hear what he has to say about medicine. He said, the future medicines after me will be the medicine of frequencies. Imam W.D. Muhammad said that the Quran is the promised reading. And I'm saying that a promise is not here yet. It's, it's in the future, but it's promised to come. It's guaranteed to come because it's a promise. When I promise my children something, I'm going to deliver. When Allah promises you something, such as the Quran, his word, hmm, yeah, well, then it means that it will eventually get here. I believe the onset of that getting here is what we're doing right now through pneumatics and through some other disciplines that I've heard from some other people who speak, from Imam Muhammad for sure. He opened up the floodgates for my mind in understanding how important the connection to the fitra actually is beyond its aesthetics, beyond its beauty, beyond its landscapes, beyond its trees and bees and flowers and bugs and birds and animals and all this beautiful stuff we have around us and sweet tasting fruits and all of that, fresh air and all of that, that's all fitra, but that's the aesthetic side of the fitra. We're talking about the side of the fitra that actually signals messages to the human intellect to begin comparing the things in the fitra with things in ourselves. And that's how true healing used to take place back in the ancient days. They would simply look at something in the fitra and they would compare it with something inside the body that looks like that thing in the fitra. I'll show you the chart on that hopefully the next time we meet. There's a whole chart online. Parts of the body that look like different fruits and vegetables. <laughs> So whatever they found in the body that looked like that fruit or that vegetable, they figured it was good for that part of the body. So there are parts of your body that look like celery. There are parts of your body that look like uh, uh, kidneys, kidney beans. Your kidneys look like kidney beans. And they found out that kidneys are good for the kidney beans are good for the kidneys. You know, asparagus is good for this. Tomatoes are good for that. And, you know, onions have layers that look like the layers of the human eye. And they found out that Onions are good for the eye. Carrots look like the eye. It has the same kind of circular layer and uh, infrastructure. And those things are good for those parts of the body. So we didn't need somebody to get a degree or a PhD in medicine to tell us what's good for the body. All we had to do was keep paying attention to Allah's fitrah. The fitrah was teaching us what was good for the body. See? But when you stop paying attention to the fitrah, as Stevie Wonder said, if you believe in things that you don't understand, then you suffer. Superstition ain't the way. So if you're guessing your way through life, that's really superstition, isn't it? When you don't know, when you're in the dark and you're guessing and you keep doing the same rituals over and over again, that's what superstitious people do. I don't know what bowing down to this rock is actually doing in terms of good things for my life. I think that when I bow down to this rock and ask it to do certain things, although it can't talk, it can't walk, it can't eat. But when I pray to it and I ask it for rain, sometimes it rains. Well, sometimes that's your mental energy is doing that because the human being is an energy frequency modulator. And we, we luck up on things. and <laughs> We give the credit to a rock. We give the credit to a tree. We give the credit to some, some, some church, some cheap. See, we're going to go, oh, man, I'm seeing that. We could have saw that without puffing on that thing, buddy. 
if you know how to control the frequency modulations related to your mind and emotions. That's what we've been talking about for the past few classes. Putting the reins of that control back in the hands of sincere, honest, thinking people. Not just any people, thinking people, curious people, and nice. Now, in the surah called El Furqan, that's the 25th surah, first ayah, look at what Allah says. La baraka alladhi nazzal al furqana ala abdihi li yakuna lil alameen. Nadiran. Blessed is he. Tabaraka alladhi. Blessed is he. We talked about that word baraka in a previous class not too long ago. The carrying over of gifts from one place to another. See? Well, that's what Allah is doing. He's carrying over gifts from his storehouse, his unlimited storehouse of goodies. And he says that blessed is he who sent down the criterion to his servant, that it may be an admonition to all creatures. El alamin. You've heard that phrase before. It's in al Fatiha. And it means to all creatures. It also means what Imam Muhammad interpreted as to all systems of knowledge. See? That what Allah sent down as the furqan, according to this ayah, is a blessing to all systems of knowledge. How is that, instructor? Because systems of knowledge are contained with, within frequency modulation. Everything in, in creation is energy, and energy operates based on frequencies. You see how you can better understand the Quran when you understand its fitra-based connections? And you can be a homegrown scientist without having gotten a degree. I'm a homegrown science. I don't have a degree. That's encouragement for some of you. <laughs> and if you already have a degree, you can get re-qualified and super-duper qualified in the sciences. So Allah is calling himself blessed. That's interesting. But we're not going to visit that idea today. Now, if cells are batteries, as Dr. Joe Dispenza postulates, the question is then whether your batteries are charged. Are your cellular batteries charged? Because batteries can lose their charge and thereby lose their effectiveness. Likewise, if your souls are not charged, remember we compared the consonantal connections in the word cell, C-E-L-L, -L, and soul, S-O-U-L, consonantally connected sounds, the S-L sound with the S-L sound, even though in the word cell, they begin with a C. That's supposed to be a secret, that that C is really an S. Or that C can sometimes be a K, like in the word cake. Yes, the K sound. <laughs> there really is no C sound. It's going to either be the S sound, like circus, or the K sound, like circus. Two Cs, two different sounds. Let's continue. Cell and soul. If cells are batteries that need to be recharged every now and then, or even replaced as all of the cells in your body eventually are. Cells die off, cells are born. Cells die off, new cells are born. Well, in your soul is where your basic personality is and personalities die off from time to time and new personalities are born. It's supposed to be that way. When you know better, your mama used to say you should do better. That's you coming into a new personality. The Quran is designed to advance the human life, the human intellect, the human emotionality, the human spirit, and the human instincts to advance it incrementally so that you grow in and out of many different personalities before you die, inshallah. Ain't no, 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 no downside to that. You can't stay the same. As the song says, everything must change. Nothing stays the same. 
Nothing is permanent, they say, except for change. So if your souls are not charged, then how can we expect to have optimum health, mental health, moral health, emotional health, spiritual health? Your souls have to constantly be charged and recharged. Hmm? Dead ideas have to be casted out from on out. And new ideas have to be born and utilized. Following the fitwa. To be charged also can mean to be accountable. If you get arrested and you go to court, they're going to charge you with something called a crime. But you can also be charged with responsibility in your home by your parents for doing certain things before you go out and play. See, that's a charge. Charge doesn't necessarily mean that you did something bad that you're going to get locked up about. Charge simply means that you're being held to a particular level of responsibility. Look at what the Quran says. In the fifth surah, Al-Ma'idah, the table spread, ayat 105, look at what Allah says. He says, oh, you who believe, guard your own souls. If you follow guidance, no hurt can come to you. Listen to this, people who are calling yourselves believers. Look at what Allah is saying to you and to the rest of humanity, not just you, but to any who accept faith. Yeah, ayyuhalladina amanu. All those of you who have accepted faith is what Allah is saying to you. He says, guard your own souls. Now, they used to have the translation as your own souls obligate you. You see what we mean by responsibility? It used to say your own souls obligate you. And that's actually the better translation than what they've changed it to. I don't know why they changed it. But alaykum and fusakum means Upon you is the responsibility for your own souls. And then Allah says, if you follow the guidance, no hurt can come to you from those who stray. So stop worrying about what people are going to think about what you think about what they think about what you think. That shouldn't even be your concern. If I stop making this ritual prayer, you know, at the mass, they're going to think um you know if i don't call the advan and say allahu akbar in my own head i know that's not valid but you know what are the believers going to think see you, you yeah, don't worry about whether you should be worrying about what allah thinks allah says that they worry more about what people think than what i think <laughs> allah says they fear men more than they fear allah allah says that in the quran you mean worrying about what no people think <laughs> if it's your mother, daddy, whoever, if you're doing the right thing according to Allah's guidance, then on you shall be no fear, nor shall you boohoo about anything that they do. You will not be grieving. If you do it to be for a moment, I'm sorry we got to break up this relationship, but I can't live with you anymore. You're an idol worshiper. You're a mushrik. I can't put up with that. And if I can't bring you around a better sense and prove it to you from the guidance of God, we got to go our separate ways. The day of the great separation. So Allah says that the goal of you all is to Allah. It is he that will show you the truth of all that you do. So don't worry about it. Allah is going to show each and every individual who contended with you, really contending with the truth of what Allah revealed, because that's what you should be using as your backup, not just your own wit. You're supposed to be saying, no, I hear what you're saying. And I know what we've been doing for the past 20 years in this masjid or in this church. But I can't accept Jesus, the white savior on the wall, crucified. I can't accept him as God. I can't accept the idea that they could kill God. I'm sorry, pastor. I love you. <laughs> you know, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. But I can't go for that, as the song says. No can do. Am I being too raw with y'all? Let me know now if I need to slow down and water it down a little bit or maybe come to a conclusion. I don't know. You're awfully, no, sorry, I don't, you're awfully quiet. Not at all. Not at all. All right. Hello. I need my battery charged also, so talk back to me every now and then. Alhamdulillah. 
Brother, you already knew before you <laughs> opened your mouth the lie was behind you, beside you, all inside of you. You come on, man. <laughs> yes, indeed. But let me tell you something. It's no fun being in paradise by yourself. Yes, I like yes. to know other people. When I turn this way, I like to see Hassan. You know, when I turn that way, I like to see Abdullah. I like to see Patricia. I like to see, you know, William. I like to see my friends in that same paradise enjoying the same kind of pleasures. That's the only reason I ask. I, I've been sick in the bed. I, I had a free for about four days. Yeah, and I've been okay. sick in the bed. All That's right. why I, I didn't have a, the camera on. But okay. no, no, you ain't by yourself. I told you. But we're gonna send some healing frequencies over there to your to your to your neighborhood and your address. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. All right, William uh, Safir. Yes. Remind us, remind us at the end of this conversation today to make a special dua. I'll ask you to do it, and anyone else who wants to make additional duas for all of the people among us and the people that we don't know who have fallen ill in recent times. <laughs> or who may fall ill in the future because yes. we have to do our best to stay as healthy as we can stay that's what this whole ramadan uh period is supposed to represent so let me get through this and then we'll make sure we send those healing energies out to you inshallah, inshallah. i feel better already all right i know you do I know how this works i know you do all right okay folks mute your phone and let's, let's get uh let's get through with this session i'm anxious to hear from you Okay, so Allah is promising you, us, that he is the goal. He's the end goal of everything that we're doing. And whatever missteps we make, Allah is going to explain it. He's going to bring the truth of it out when we meet him. And when we meet him does not necessarily mean when we die. You can meet Allah right here as you live. Allah can speak to you right here and explain to you the truth of everything that you're doing, have done, and probably will do. Because that's how tender and merciful Allah is with his human creatures. Now, that term, alaykum, as I told you, implies a reciprocal responsibility. Mute your phones if they're not muted. Alaykum and fusakum. It's right here. Alaykum and fusakum. They say, guard your own souls. I say, your own souls obligate you. And obligate is the better translation of alaykum. When we say salam alaykum to each other, what we're saying is that peace obligates you to do what? To return the peace reciprocally. Doesn't have to be the same way that I gave it to you, but you're supposed to give me something in return. That's what alaykum means. Alaikum is from the smaller word ala. Ala means up on top of. See, when you tell somebody who's asked you to do something at the job and they see you later on and the boss asks you that you get that taken care of, you say, well, I'm still doing it, boss. I'm on top of it, right? That means you're handling your business. You're doing your responsibility because you are up on it. If a desert dweller puts himself up on top of a camel or up on a donkey back or up on a horse's saddle. See, he does that because he's charging his animal, that horse, that donkey, that camel with being responsible to do what it is he needs for them to do in the field or on the journey. He's obligating his horse to do a certain thing. See, he's all upon the horse or the camel or the mule in order for them to carry out a particular responsibility, but that's not the end of it, my friends. Whether we realize it or not, the donkey, the horse, the camel, and the mule are obligating the rider to do certain things. See, how do you expect me to carry you all the way into Jordan and beyond, and you ain't give me food yet? You ain't let me drink no water in this hot desert yet, see? You didn't give me any rest yet, but you want me to do what you wanna do, but you don't wanna reciprocate, see? Alaikum means reciprocal responsibility. So the animal is responsible to me to get where it wants to go, but I'm also responsible to the animal to make sure that it stays in good repair. Take the animal out of the picture and put your automobile in the picture. You want that 
sporty car to get you from here all the way to California, from New York to California or wherever. But what happens if you don't change the oil? What happens if you don't give it the gas that it needs when you're running low on gas? You have to be responsible, uh, responsible to the automobile, an inanimate object. You have to still be responsible if you expect to have a good relationship and for the animal or the horse in this case, or the car in this case, to get you to where you need to be. You have to be good to it as it is being good to you. That's alaykum. So when we say salam alaykum, that's what we're saying about peace. You have to reciprocate that peace. It shouldn't be just me wishing you peace. What about the peace that you owe me as a responsibility? I'm holding my tongue because I don't want to say things to injure your feelings. How come you're not holding your tongue? Why are you provoking me? When I, that's why Allah says when they get like that, just say salam. That's the end of that conversation. Allah says until they change or if they change to another theme, then you can rejoin the conversation. But if they're talking stuff that sounds like they're trying to get you to worship something other than Allah or trying to get you to go into Spooksville or smoke or drink something that you know is haram and all that, you get out of that conversation. Allah didn't say kill the kufas. He didn't say when you find a group of people like that that are talking about, the, you know, who's God and who ain't God and the black man is God and the white man and Jesus is God. You get into a conversation like that, Allah didn't say they are kufas. Kill the kufar. <laughs> you know, that's what some so-called Muslims think he's supposed to do. You get to a group of people who are talking shirk talk, and we're supposed to pull out our sword and behead them, you know. No. Allah says, leave their company. You see how gentle Allah is? Just get up and leave. Don't participate in the conversation. But look at what Allah says behind that. Until they change to an alternate theme. So now if you come back and you listen in on the group chat or whatever, or you're in a group chat, you know how we do now. And they're not talking about the shirk talk anymore. They're not talking about the big booty baby that they passed this afternoon that you don't want nothing to do with. But now they're talking about getting together on a business uh, venture or doing something or maybe going uh, uh, fishing, fishing expedition next weekend. And you can handle that. You can do that. This is your cousin you're talking to, you know. Well, this is your workmate. You don't want bad relationships with them, but you're letting them know that you're not going to participate in their foolishness. That's all. But you can rejoin that conversation. Doesn't mean you're going to go on the expedition. But now you know what kind of conversations they're likely to have. But you can rejoin it just for the purposes of what? Keeping the peace, the salam, the wholeness, the unity. So that's alaykum. We spoke last time about the word Ramadan itself. For those who might have missed that, I'm going to give it very quickly. Breaking it down by its syllables and by its letters, the Arabic letter Ra in Ramadan alludes to the sun, S-U-N. The Arabic letter Mim in Ramadan alludes to the moon. And the moon has a magnetizing effect upon the earth's waters. You know, it magnetizes water. It pulls the tides on planet earth. And the last syllable, Dod, in Ramadan, the A-N on the end of Ramadan is a suffix. It's not a part of the root word letters for the word. It means earth, but it means dead earth. And it's dead because it has been depleted of its moisture content. So when earth is depleted of its moisture content, it begins to crackle. So it begins to crack and split like your dry skin does if you put it under a microscope when it's dry. It'll look just like the dry earth. And dry earth is not going to grow a single doggone thing for you. If you let your soil become depleted of moisture and rain doesn't come, it is a waste of time, energy, and resources to begin planting good seeds into that dry earth. Minus the water, it's not going to grow for you. There will be no growth for you. No growth, knee growth. That's how Negroes are created, by depleting them of their moisture content. Water is also money, you know. <laughs> That's how they created the American Negro, by depleting him of his financial resources. Took a whole continent away from him.
<laughs> he gave me a poor broke as a joke. Huh? No money and it wasn't funny. So Negro also means to deplete you of your uh, financial resources. You know, we call the bank a bank because of the river bank. We talk about drowning in debt. So water has also been equated with finance. Think about that. So because we had no finances to think of back in the day, especially, we also became devoid of water and therefore devoid of growth because you can have the best laid plan in the world if there's nothing there no one there to finance that plan it will die in your head with you that's why we're trying to get financial support for nunetics and i know it's out there waiting i know it's about to knock on the door any day now and say instructor bilal I am so-and-so financier, and I see the good work you're doing. Man, if I put some of my financial resources with your great ideas, with a team of energetic people that you have backing you for all of these years, some of them have been here, how long, instructor? 10 years, 20 years, some of these people? Yeah, yeah. That's the kind of energy that I want to intermingle with. Let's sit down and talk about a plan. I know that's coming. I already see it. It's already happened. Keep listening and keep watching. But if you drop out of this class, you pick in the absolute worst time <laughs> to say, I'm tired of this. I can't go any further. You know, I can't come up with the payments. I can't buy the books. <laughs> this is the wrongest time on earth for you to make that move on this chessboard because we're about to be crowned king. Not me, Nunetics, king of academics. You heard it here first. Now, the word psalm, which is normally translated as fasting, I put it in quotation marks because that's not the actual factual meaning for this word psalm, S-A-W-M. The actual meaning for psalm is related to being steadfast. If you want to use the word fast, use it within the context of this word, steadfast. Fast. You'll understand in a moment. That letter sod that begins the word psalm. So now we're going to do an explanation of the essential consonants in the word psalm. And those consonants are sod and meme. There's a wow in between, but that's an additional letter to elongate the sound. Saum, saum. But the, in, the original or the initial letters are just two letters, the sod and the meme. So let's talk about what these letters mean. And I'm going to be giving you some serious, deep-rooted details. So pay attention. And if you miss what I'm saying tonight, simply purchase your copy or some of you already have it and haven't looked at it, your book, New Netics, because that's where I'm getting most of these meanings from. What an inspiration, that book. Man, oh man, only Allah could have given me that. So listen to this explanation. Sod, as a part of your body, represents the chest muscles in the torso. The chest muscles in this part of the body, the torso. Hmm? And you know what the torso has within it? Vital organs without which you could not continue to live. You can continue to live without a whole set of legs. You could continue to live without one or even both of your arms being present on your body. You can continue to live if your hair gets cut, you know, <laughs> no problem. If uh, whatever happens to the rest of your body, so be it in this case. But if anything happens to those vital organs within the torso, we're talking now about the heart and the lungs and the spleen and the kidneys and the, that good stuff that are all power packed into the torso. <laughs> you see, you're going to be in trouble. You're going to be on a breathing machine. You're going to be on a heart monitor with a fake heart being in the artificial heart. Now you got to pretend. So when things start to go awry within the torso framework, that's going to be the cause of a lot of sickness and illness. So in the word for fasting, psalm, that begins with sod, that 
first letter in the word Saum, the letter Saud, represents those things in the torso that protect the integrity of the entire life form. Any environment which surrounds and protects living entities. See, these organs are living entities within your chest, within your torso. Living entities. And the torso, along with its bone structure, its ribs, its skin uh, layers, it's, 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 it's surrounding those vital organs as a protection for those organs. So any environment which surrounds and protects living entities is under this particular letter. So the word in the Quran, in the Arabic language for the chest is sudur. See, sudur, let me put that on the board here. Forgot to include that, very important word, sudur. See? And it is consonantally connected to the word or so. Let me make it clear for you. Sudur is the sod, the, uh, I believe it's a dal, the, and a ra. Whereas torso, as you know, T interchanges with the D. So it's the T, it's the R, and it's the S. So this is how both words are related. Sudur is the S-D-R. Torso is the T-R-S. T interchanges with the D, and therefore sudur and torso are going to be related words. And they are, because here is your chest region. So that which is protecting the integrity of this region, that which is uh, allowing for this region to be uh, reinforced with strength and power. That's what the letter sawed means. So when you read words in the Quran now like sudur, you know how power packed those meanings are above and beyond what hands were in the dictionary of the Holy Quran and Lane's lexicon can tell you. Not their fault. They are not students of El Fitra. They are students of El Scholar. Allah bless them for their efforts, but a new day is here. So abstract meanings for the letter sod are this. Things that are healthy, firm. You heard of beating the chest. Apes do that, right? Oh, that represents their strength. You know, I'm here. Oh, you can't handle this, right? The torso. Sound, meaning completely put together correctly, sound. United, as all of the organs are. Your organs are united in your chest, just like the galaxies have planets that are organized and not bumping into each other, serving their own individual purposes, but still working as a galaxy, see? As above, so below. Allah says instructing signs in the skies, instructing signs in the earth and like signs in you, but most people go on heedless, so says Allah in the Quran. And they go on heedless in a way that suggests that they're going on headless. See, heed and head are from the same consonantal connections. And so is the Arabic word hudan, which means guidance, because guidance is supposed to be leading your life in the same way that your head is the leader over your body, see? And it also represents personal integrity. Your own personal, your body has its own personal integrity. Aside from everybody else's body, your body has its own integrity. So some of us invest in this body. We get in the gym once, twice a week or whatever, and we work it out and we try to let the blood flow correctly and all of that. We try to do our breathing exercises and techniques. We do our Tai Chi and all of that stuff, right? To keep this personal body fit and integrated working together without any unnecessary complications. Now, the letter Mim in Saum refers to the stomach, the stomach. Now, I thought you said that uh, Bait was the stomach instructor. Well, I misspoke, if that's what I said. I believe it is what I said, because they're in the same region. 
but bait actually is the gut. Hmm? Bait actually is the butun, and we have to discriminate or distinguish at least between the stomach and the gut. The gut does not stretch to accommodate what is situated in the gut. The stomach, however, does extend itself. See, when food comes in, the stomach knows how to protrude. When the food is released or burned away, then the stomach knows how to go back to its fit or default setting. See, the gut doesn't do that. The gut is situated, stationary. So that's the difference. So remember that, make a note of that, that bait is the gut. And meme is the stomach. So the stomach, which is a contained area whose size grows and shrinks as food enters and exits the gut. It grows and shrinks. What makes it different from bait is that bait doesn't grow and shrink. Bait fills up and then empties out. See, that's the difference. That's the difference. Bait fills up and then empties out. Whereas the stomach grows in measurement and then shrinks and then grows again when you put new food in it and then shrinks when it dissipates. Foods become liquefied and therefore meme has come to represent any substance which produces water, moisture. Huh? And we know that morals have the word water as a symbol of what it does. So it's any substance that produces water. And we also include water as being emotional and moral thinking that cleanses the, the person's life when you start thinking morally, or even when you show pure and true emotions for something, someone, or something happened that's bad and you cry about it, you feel better after you cry tears of water. You feel better after a good rainstorm comes through and you can smell that newly fresh ozone in the air. Oh, you feel so. You want to go out for a walk after the rain's good. Because Allah designed water as a refresher for the environment, not to mention for your personal situation. Yeah, go ahead and get a good workout and you start sweating and all that and you can't wait to go home and take that shower and you feel so good. You can sleep like a baby. Why? Because of the water and how it has been designed by Allah to refresh your human life. Meme is not only water, but meme is also milk. It's also blood. In other words, meme, that letter can represent any vital liquid that is responsible for life. And we know that life needs blood. Life needs milk when it first gets here from mama's breasts, right? And life absolutely for the rest of its life needs water. Hmm? So what is milk on the symbolic level? We're talking about now milk as human kindness. See, you heard of that, the milk of human kindness, the softness. Do you know that Allah says in the Quran that the faithful ones who have committed to being at peace with each other and with others, do you know that Allah says that our treatment towards each other should be like milk? He said, you should be rough against the aggressors, but like milk with each other. Isn't that beautiful? Oh, that's so beautiful. Hmm? Yeah. Compassion. Sweetness. Kind words. That's what Ramadan is all about. And blood, as you know, represents your social nature. So it's dealing with social grace and the distribution of that grace, that assistance to people, the sharing of those things that they need to continue living a good life or maybe even to first establish a good life if they're in a bad situation. We share with them. It's doing the same thing that the blood do, does with its nutrition inside your body. It takes it from one part of the body. It services that part of the body. 
with enough to satisfy that part of the body. And then it motivates itself. It moves itself to another part of the body. And all of that is based on energetic interactions hmm? of electromagnetic forces within the body. That's what's doing that. The us, and he told me. Because the stomach, and I'm underlining M in all of the words that I come across that contain the letter M. So you'll be thinking about these meanings while you're looking at those words because they apply to each and every one of these words that have M underlined within them. So because the stomach handles a volume, see? Stretching, expanding, contracting, just like the stomach. Expanding, contracting, see? Volume. Because the stomach handles volume, and you know volume goes up and down. The volume of money in my bank account, sometimes it's up, sometimes it's down. We're going to try to keep it up going into this year and next year. But the point is that, that the letter meme has also come to represent measurements. You see that? Measurements, volume, increase, decrease, volume, measurements. That letter meme not only means water, not only means blood, not only means milk, it also represents measurements of things. So examine these following words, the word mass, you know that that deals with what we're describing. Multiplication, you can add and you can subtract, see, volume. Accumulation, the same thing. If you go to the weekend jam session, see, that's where a lot of things are coming together. And you get in there, you jam, you boogie, you do what you do when you go to the jam. And then when the music has been turned off and the lights have been turned down or turned off, then you leave. So the volume of people who were there at the party, all of that volume becomes lessened until there's no more people in the party. That's the meme in the word jam that's doing that. So what about the word in the Quran called Jum'ah? Uh, what about the word in the Quran called the Jami'ah? meaning a group, see? The meme is always dealing with measurements that increase and decrease, increase and then decrease. Just like the English letter itself, it increases, decreases. Increases, decreases. That's the letter M as an English glyph that they found on the walls of ancient Egypt. <laughs> mm. The word jamada, in Arabic means coagulation, see? A group of things coming together, binding and bonding together, coagulation. The English word many, it can be many, but it can turn into few. Most, it's most to begin with, then it's some when it's all said and done, right? Most of them came to the party, some of them had a good time, see? Same thing. And some is still a measurement. Some is still more than one, so the word some has an M in it also. I want you to think about it for every word that you come across that has the letter M within it. Now, meme, its multiplication or its multiplicity is non-specific. You need to take this, get the replay, sit down, play it back, and take serious notes. Meme represents multiplicity, but so does the letter tha, T-H-A, tha, means three or more, tha. That's why it's in the word three, because once you get three, you can continue to multiply, because there's you, that's one, there's your wife, that's two, and then when there's three of you is when you have a child. Now, that child will grow on to grow up and have babies his or her own, of his or her own. And those generations will continue ad infinitum. If it's just you and your wife and you don't have any children, then your legacy and your destiny, genetically speaking, stops with the both of you. But as soon as you have a third, it represents multiplicity. See? But again, the letter meme represents multiplicity also, but unlike tha, whose multiplicity is specific, 
Okay, three plus how many? Okay, right now in the generations, there's me, my wife, my child, and he gave us a grandchild. He married and gave us a grandchild. So there's about four or five of us now. See, but it's very specific. That's fat. But memes inference is that its multiplicity is can be eventually just un, uncountable. I mean, just forget about trying to put a last number on it. You see? So there is no concern for the amount of atoms, cells, and tissues within water. You don't have scientists going to the water trying to count the number of cells, cellular structures floating on the water or on the lily pad. Or you, it, 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 They'll be wasting their time trying to. It's like trying to count the stars. And the word for star is najim. It also has a mean. You get it? See, as soon as you understand this logic, you're able to identify words in the Quran and give them their broadest inference. How wonderful is that to understand and learn during the month of Ramadan? Ramadan. Alhamdulillah. 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 Buddy, I was waiting for that. <laughs> Thank you. Alhamdulillah, I love this so much. The word hamd, <laughs> it's meme. See, now you can take this logic and just apply it anywhere that you see meme in the Quran. That can be your homework assignment that you give to yourself. Let me just go through Al-Baqarah and write down every word, not try to figure it out when I see it immediately, but at least write down, or go to a shorter, sir, you know, ikhlas or something, and see if there are any meme words in there. Take it out of that, sir, the last 30th of the Quran. Start over there and start just writing down the words that you find that have meme attached to them, especially if it's in the beginning of a word. Go to the Lane's lexicon or to the dictionary of the Holy Quran and look under M, look under meme, and just look at the word. They all meme now in the dictionary and say to yourself, let me see if it applies. Let me see if what instructed Bilal discovered applies to all of these meme words in the dictionary. Oh, man, what a study. You forget to eat. Just don't forget to bathe, you know, don't forget to shower, but you can skip a meal every now and then. I know I can. So it's non-specific, non-specific. And there is no concern for the amount of atoms with its meme, the amount of cells and tissues. You're not concerned about that because they are exponential. When you're trying to find those things within water, within milk and blood, when you try to count the cellular structures in there that are comprised of atoms, they are uncountable. Meme is not concerned necessarily with the specificity of the exact number of a thing. Meme is more concerned with the quantity, a lot. It just needs to know that it's a lot. <laughs> that there's a lot of people at the jam. That's all it needs to know. There's a lot of people at Juma. see? They don't need to know, well, exactly. Did you have a bean counter at the door when the people were coming to Juma? Why? Why do I need to know that there were, you know, 43 people at Juma as opposed to, you know, 37 people? What sense does that? I'm not there as a bean counter. I just know there was a lot of folks. I'm stepping over trying to get my spot on the floor. See? Non-specificity. Concerned only with quantity and quality. How was the khutbah when you went to that Juma session? Yeah, you're talking about the same old thing, singing the same old song, just a different feeling, you know, just a different rhythm, just a different message since I've been gone. But he's singing the same old song, rituals, judgment, trying to put fear of me that I'm going to go to hell if I don't give more money to the masjid, you know, that kind of thing. That's the same old song. Lack of quality. And that lack of quality is going to eventually produce, this is a warning to some of you imams, and you've got two M's in your name. This is a warning that if you continue to give that nonchalant <laughs> irrelevant kind of khutbah that you've been given. Your lack of quality is going to eventually produce a lack of quantity. Your lack of quality is going to eventually and for sure produce 
a lack of quantity, the people will start to leave. And a word to the wise is sufficient. You want to get your messages packed? Take just pinches off of pneumatics as a method and start teaching. You don't have to tell them I said it. You don't have to call it pneumatics. Just start making these consonantal connections for words that you find in the Quran. You'll be good to go. That word about you being this kind of teacher will spread like wildfire. And before you know it, a month later, folks will be practically jam-packing your musala. Musala. Now, the volume of authority related to Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, as al-malik is innumerable. See, Allah has a volume that is uncountable. Allah says that when he gives, he gives without counting. You can't count the blessings and the treasures and the mercy and all of these things that Allah gives you as the merciful benefactor. You can't count them. You die first before you could even come close to what Allah is giving in volume to not just you. Allah is the control of all of the galaxies and all of the universes. And he does it without a problem, without complaining, without sweating, <laughs> without any of those things we do. And one of his attributes, as mentioned, is al-malik. See, in al-fatiha, it says maliki yawmiddin, the owner, the master of the day of deen. The letter meme also represents things in the middle, things down center, things in the middle. Allah refers to us as the midway community in the Arabic phrase, ummatan wasata. Remember these short sayings, ummatan wasata. Umma, obviously, is community. Wasata is from wusta. And it means the middle, the equilibrium point. Just like a water, if you let it loose, it's going to continue to move until it finds its equilibrium. Then it comes to rest. That's the end game, the end goal for water, wherever you find it. If it's going to achieve its peace, it has to keep moving energetically until it finds that equilibrium station to rest upon. And what is that word for peace? Salam. You see that? Meme is everywhere. The letter meme is in the exact center of the Arabic alphabet. The letter M is in the exact center of the English alphabet. Do you think that's an accident or a coincidence? <laughs> uh -uh. It's perfectly calculated. These were thinkers who established these sciences, including the linguistic sciences. In Al-Baqarah, Allah says in Surah 2, Ayah 143, Thus have we made of you an ummat justly balanced. Ummatan wasata, justly balanced. Meme also suggests things primary and primal. So water is primary. Milk is primary. Blood, as you know, is primary. And they are all sources of life that keep life continuing to flourish. So the meme letter appears in many words related to mothering. Let me just move this. Give me one moment to move this to where I, I actually wanted it. Let's see if I can manipulate this. Here. There we go. Hold on. We'll get it together. Oops. 
Give me one moment. Interesting. Oops. Bear with me. We'll leave it as M because it symbolizes meme. <laughs> so meme also suggests things primary and primal. Water, milk, and blood are primary sources of life and appears in many words related to mothering and to nurturing. And you can see it here that the fetus in the womb, the person in the sleeping position, as well as the I can't even call it an embalmed body, but it's a body from ancient days that is being fossilized in that position from hundreds, maybe a few thousand years ago that they found. In the ancient days, they used to bury bodies in the fetal position is the point. Today, they lay you out and they put your hands crossed across here like this, across the heart and all that, but not in the ancient days. Ancient civilizations, all of them to a letter, used to bury their people in the fetus position because they understood that that is the position that every child is in before it becomes delivered into this world that we know. And when you come here, Allah lets you keep that same fitra position. You tell me when you curl up in that fetal position and you're trying to get some sleep or you're going to get some good sleep. Better than if you're stressed out. Oh. You come home and especially if it's a little chilly in the room where you, you know, you just say, oh, my goodness. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about. All right, let me just let me try and get my uh, my correct uh, positioning back here, if I can. Yeah, okay, this is good enough. All right, so that M or that meme suggests the things that are primary and primal, and we spoke about those things as water, milk, and blood being the primary sources of life, and words related to mothering carry that M sound also, and also to nurturing. With the stomach being a temporary container, as mentioned, meme is used in words referring to our pre-existence in the womb. Now we're going a little bit more deeper in terms of the science. Meme, I repeat, is used in many words that are referring to our pre-existence in the womb. You see the letter M in womb, but you also see it in the word for womb in Arabic called Raham. Raham. It's seen also in our states of sleep in this world. Sleep is called a noun. In the Adhan, they say, As-salatu khayrun min al-naum. So that is better than sleep. See, naum is sleep. You might say, well, I heard that word somewhere else when I was in the master talking to a brother and I asked him something and he said naum. And I thought he was saying yes. Well, yeah, he was saying yes. But naum and naum are from the same consonantal root letters, but they mean two different things. Naum means Yes. When you shake your head and agree, yes. Nam, nam. If you're not agreeing, you say la, la, la. If you're agreeing, you say nam. Well, how are they related, instructor Bilal? Well, how is saying yes with your head as a gesture related to sleep? Let's look at it again. Pay careful attention this time. Here's you saying now. Yes. Here's you falling asleep. If you understood that, let me know real quick. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> man, if Allah hasn't given us, Allah has given us the science, man, to beat all sciences right now. Yes, we do. Uh, 
Can you see yourself explaining that to your Arabic speaking brothers? I mean, your true Arab brothers and Pakistani brothers and, uh, you know, Mauritanian brothers, Muslims, who are, they've been struggling with this language or maybe not even thinking about it for years, maybe generations in their families. Now we can come to that with the refresh button, man. You tell them that and they will tell everybody in their family what you just said. You know what your brother said about Nam and Nam? <laughs> and you said, well, I thought uh, Nam was from the root word that gives us the word for cattle, see? El, el, uh, el Anam, El Anam, the cattle, the sixth sir, El Nam. I thought that was, well, how was that related to nodding and sleep and uh, rest and uh, <laughs> an agreement? I'm going to tell you how. You ready for this next one, y'all? Listen to this. Ugh. Cattle are called uh, by that name because that name means softness. It means being gentle. And because cattle, now we're not talking about porcupines and skunks. Cattle on the most part are soft to the touch. Now you might say, well, so is a skunk. Yeah, but the skunk is going to give you something to remember her by. See, a cow is not going to poo-poo on your shoe as you stand there stroking its leather. Because the cow represents civilized behavior. Civilized behavior. And it is soft to the touch like a horse. See? That's what we're talking about. So what happens when you try to stroke a, a, um, a porcupine? You're going to get pricked. What happens if you try to reach out to a skunk before you get there? It's going to get you with its stench. And you're going to, oh, oh, man, for miles you can be driving and you smell that skunk in the air, right? That somebody ran over or that the skunk got afraid of and let loose that mist. So you don't even get a chance to pet a skunk in that regard. For that moment, at least, maybe when they've been de whatever mystified, I don't know what the word is for taking away their skunk pack. <laughs> and you see them in the zoo, maybe you might be able to reach out and touch them. I don't know. I've never tried and I never thought about it and will never think about it. Okay. But the point here is that those animals that are soft to the touch and that are approachable, you see, people that are soft in their nature and are approachable, we call them civilized. So that word for cattle represents the people who have been socially civilized. And that's why you can approach them and touch them and pet them and milk them if they're cattle, if they're cows, etc. Because they're soft to the touch. And soft to the touch means what? The fact that they don't buck you means that they're being agreeable. What's another way of saying agreeable? I agree. Yes, Nam. Yes, you see the connections in this logic. It's so fascinating. I'm telling you. It's a wonder I sleep at all at night. And I stay awake for most of you to do exactly what we're doing now. This doesn't come just pouring down into my brain. This is the effect of some seriously diligent study. Trust me when I tell you that. Not too bad for a high school graduate, huh? I thank Allah. Alhamdulillah. All right. So. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. That's the same as the body when it's numb. Yeah. Yeah, it becomes agreeable. If the body is numb, what happens before they try to give you a, a surgery? They numb your gums. I know it, you're that's right. In dental surgery, or they numb the spot, local anesthesia, if they're going to do something local on your body, right? And then the body becomes agreeable. You got it, my friend. All right, let's keep moving. It's beautiful. So, meme as used in words referring to our pre existence in the womb, it refers to our states in this present world when we sleep, although the sleep is temporary. So, is the time in the womb is temporary. And then our death and burial, which is called malt. Death, mouth, beginning also with a mean, which means there's a measurement 
even in terms of the time that you spend in the grave. We're not going to get into all of that, but just understand that it can expand or it can contract. You can be in there for a long, 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 long time, or you can go straight from this life, pass over the bridge of death and be in Jannah, Theodos. What a wonderful Allah, Allah is. But all of those three states are temporary. All of these activities, as I said, take place in fetal positions. Now, in the Quran, we're going to speed this up just a bit. In the Quran, Jesus is called Isa. You should say that to yourself with that strain on that first letter, Ain. See, Jesus is called Isa. And from that name, we get the English word E. See? Isa was a holistic healer who advocated the use of the mind as the major factor in being able to heal thyself. Jesus said to his followers, he said, physician, heal yourself. They were coming to him talking about, please lay your hands on me or on my girlfriend or on my baby, my child. She's sick. He's sick. He's dying. She's this. She's that. Lazarus is over there dying on us. Can you just go over there and say a few words to him or maybe uh, touch him or let her touch the hem of your garment? I don't care what you do, Jesus. I need you to heal. And Jesus said, physician, heal yourself. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> oh, man. Boy, oh, boy, oh, boy, this is wonderful knowledge. So what was he saying? He was saying that Allah has already gifted you with all of the qualifications for healing yourself and your healing uh, tools are right here between your ears. Concentration, meditation, you get it? Contemplation, as I mentioned, as being the initial positionings that your mind has to come into for that great experience called as that we've been speaking about for many weeks now and that I have in a book, volume one, the true meaning of the salat. I'm coming out with volume two in about another week or two. Those who pay for their uh, next month's 21st semester, you pay before what's today, the 26th. If you pay before the 28th, you get that book free of charge. It's a $40 value. If you pay after that, then so be it. Alhamdulillah. But you have to pay for the actual book after the 28th. I might stretch it out to the, the last of the month, whatever that is. What is this month? 30 days, I think. 31 days? I don't know. Whatever this month is, I think it's 31 days, the longest month in the year, I believe March is. All right. So let's take it to the 31st. If you pay for your next month's uh, charge by the 31st of March, you'll get that book, $40 value, for free. And thank you, as always, for your support. Some of you have already made that purchase, and I thank you for that. So we're talking about Isa representing ease for people. And the opposite of ease is dis-ease. The English word heal is from the Quranic Arabic word halal. Even the English word hell is from the Quranic Arabic word halal. You might say, well, now you, you've crossed the line there, instructor. How can halal be related to hell because if you understand the true purpose of hell as it's given in both the bible and the quran you'll understand that it is a remedial process it's the necessary burning that has to occur to get all of that dross matter and all of that negative stuff that has nothing to do with allah's fitrah it's to get that, it's to burn that out of you. Do you know that one of the meanings for salah itself is to roast? My goodness, wait for this book number two. You're going to be shocked. It, look in the dictionary under those uh, letters. It means to burn. And it's given like that in the Quran. To roast, to burn, to punish. So how is that ritual thing you're doing related to that meaning? You explain it to me in an email. 
you don't know the depth that the Quran goes to to establish logic for the human being to grow by. So heal is related to halal. And what does halal mean in essence? You say, oh, it means um, permissible meat. No, it means permissible, period. That which is permissible. What's permissible in Allah's estimation? Your good fortune, your, your health, your wealth, all of the things that he has allowed you, that he has made halal for you. Hmm? That's what's permissible. You might not know it, but the name Allah itself is related to the word halal. You'll find that in my book called, how did I put that? About God and Allah, someone will remember. I forget the exact title of that book. Someone will tell me. I'm Bebo or someone who knows that list. But the point is, is that I break down both of those words, and I'll be doing it next week for Masjid Allah. So if you don't get it tonight, don't worry about it. Just stay tuned next Saturday and you'll get it. So the point here is that the opposite of ease is disease. The opposite of Esau's work is sickness and illness. The opposite of Ramadan as a healing mechanism is Maradan as a way of making you sick and diseased. Halal means to be free also. Halal means to be free from those things that are not fitra based. And the things that are not fitra based are not allowed. You are not permitted to partake of those things. The things that Allah has permitted you to do. And there are only a relative few things in the Quran that Allah says are haram. Most of what you do, most of what you eat is actually halal. Even if it's something that other people on the other side of the planet are not eating, it doesn't make it haram for you. It only makes it haram if what's in it causes harm to any human being who keeps participating in it, who keeps partaking of it. Haram is not a local issue. Halal is a local issue because you could eat something that's permitted by Allah, but it could be injurious to you because you're allergic to it. Like my wife, she's severely allergic to seafood. So if she eats seafood or sometimes if she smells fish cooking, she'll stop breaking out. She's got to have a syringe and everything carrying, her, carrying it around with her because she's, for whatever reason, she's allergic. It doesn't mean that the fish is haram. It means that her response to seafood is causing that particular negative reaction. So intelligence says, don't eat fish, don't eat seafood, don't be around where people are cooking it and all of that kind of stuff. See? But haram means that it's going to harm you. See the word harm? You hear it? Haram. Harm. See? If it harms you, trust me, in time, it's going to harm everybody else. If the cigarette is haram, and it is, starting to bust some of your bubbles, dear Muslims around the world, but smoking cigarettes is haram. Well, it doesn't say that in the Quran, brother. Somebody told me that once in the 1980s. Well, brother, you say cigarettes is haram, but what's haram is what Allah said is haram and haram. Believe me, it's in there, not in the word cigarette. <laughs> but definitely in the admonition against participating in things that uh, are not good for you. <laughs> so why would Allah put all the details, cigarettes, cigars, uh, Johnny Walker Red, uh, Johnny Walker Black, uh, you know, gin and tonic? Why would Allah cause his Quran to be like 5,000 pages long because you want all the details? When Allah can give it to you in a single line, and then you just compare that line with everything that fits that description. See, Allah leaves a lot of room for the human being to use his and her intelligence, use the intellect, the aql, to figure out a lot of things without it having to be spelled out in detail all of the time. So yeah, even the word Allah is connected to halal. And Allah is the one who allows. You see that? 
So even the English word allow is related to Allah. The word allow is related to the word Allah. They got it from the word Allah because they know that Allah is the one who allows or gives permission for everything that happens. It can't happen if it were not for the will of Allah. And while we're on that subject, the word will is related to the word Allah and halal. Because if it's permitted, then Allah wills it. That's what permission is. Yes, you can do that. No, you can't do the other thing. Well, when I say no, you can't do the other thing, I'm establishing a law. We might as well go there. I'm establishing a law. Now, what's the difference between allow and law? A law has prohibitions attached to it. The law says you can be here at this particular time when this particular venue is open, but when this venue closes and the store owner locks up, then you're not allowed to be in that store busting through the window and trying to get what you want and run as quickly. See, you're not supposed to, you're not allowed to do that because of the law says that you're, see, when you allow, you permit, but the law is established to curtail the things that you would like to do when you want to do them. The law says stop at the red light. So you're not allowed to go through the light when it's red. You have to wait until the law says it turns green and then green means go. You see how this goes? So how do you arrive at the meaning for law as opposed to the meaning for allow and therefore, Allah, how do you arrive at these meanings, instructor? Because allow carries that A of negation that we spoke about earlier, that A privative that says that whatever comes after the A is being negated. So allow is the same as saying A law. So allow means not law. And not law means no prohibitions. Not law means no curtailment. You can do that. Now, it's not Allah saying that you can do anything you want, or as they say in the Masonic uh, industry, uh, do, as, do as thou wilt. No, that's not what we're saying that Allah is saying. Allah is simply saying that he has created a fitron nature that governs this entire cosmos. That gives the human being permission to do anything that he hankers for. But here's the catch. There are consequences. Yeah, there are consequences. Allah says that he is ar-Rahman. You see, what does that mean? Merciful benefactor. The one who is providing all of the benefits for every single piece of creation that comes into existence, including the human being with his crippled, demented mind and his inventions and his wanting to go against the fitra, go against science, go against common sense and reason. But Allah still allows. You, see, you understand what I mean now? Allah allow, People always say, how could this world be this messed up? How could there be a God in the world? It's just because God allows it. But you have to see the other side of that equation. Allah allows it, but he puts checks and balances and markers in that allowance so that right along the path of you doing all of those sneaky, conniving things, Allah puts checks in the road that warn you, if you keep going in this direction, you're going to meet with trouble. And it's a loud voice when you first start doing wrong. Loud moral conscience. Oh, man, no, don't. Please don't. I know you sitting in the bus and you sitting behind this uh, senior citizen and her pocketbook is open and you see the dollar bill hanging out the pocketbook and tell that young person don't do it. in his own mind. He says, nah, nah, nah. but if he does it once and he thinks he gets away with it and then he does it again and before you know it, he's knocking old ladies in the head to take their purses on the day that they get their check. Huh? That voice that initially said, don't do that, Johnny. Another few months later, he has that same opportunity that's allowing him to steal again in some form or fashion. And that voice says, one moment, the camera went out on me. That voice says, 
Don't do that, Johnny. See, the volume has been lowered because we're talking about moral conscious, conscious, conscience. See the M in moral? That means it, it has volume. It rises and it depletes. M. See? So by the end of the week, it's just whispering at him, Johnny, please, I tried to tell you. And then the voice disappears all, you know, pretty much 100%. I don't think it can completely disappear. And then that child gets arrested or that child gets beat down by somebody who sees him doing it or, you know, whatever. And then he says, man, I wish I had never done that. See, but he was allowed to do it. The way Allah designed his creation, he said, go ahead. You can do it by my permission, but it's not necessarily by my will. But the law that Allah has clocked into creation, into the cosmos, into his fitrah, is going to eventually punish you. Even if it doesn't happen immediately, it's going to happen eventually. That's the check and balance. So yes, Allah is the one who allows, but at the end of the day, at the end of the process, he's not only Ar-Rahman giving oxygen and food and good times to Adolf Hitler <laughs> and to the murderers of the world over there and whatever's happening in the Ukraine and whatever people think they're getting away with or in China, or whatever, and the, 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 you know, the meat market in China and creating diseases. Not even in China necessarily, right here in North Carolina, I believe the Corona thing got started with these mad scientists right over here in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, messing around in the laboratory. That's the real story, if you didn't know. But anyway, story for another day. The point is, is that they think they're getting away. And then all of a sudden, at one point in history, Allah just collapses the whole scheme. And Allah said there are societies right now buried beneath the sand, buried beneath the earth. And Allah asked us the question, have you heard a peep out of them since? How majestic Allah is, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Have you heard from those people lately? The ancient Sumerians and the ancient Greeks and they, you ain't heard of peep. They're buried beneath the ground, but you can't hear from them now. They can't repent now, it's too late. They can't make amends now. Their predecessors can, who are here now, but not those people. Allah said, leave them to me. Oh my goodness. I don't want to be on the other end of that divine finger. When he says, leave them to me. Let that see what they're doing, those little rascals. Depopulation plans and contaminating the world's blood through the blood banks and all. I see what they're doing. Pretending to be people helping humanity and really they're selling body parts over there in Haiti and these other places. I see what they're doing. Going around uh, scooping up homeless people off the streets of New York and at one time in the year there's uh, hundreds of homeless people in the streets of New York and a particular mayor comes in and all of a sudden by next year all of the homeless people are gone. Where did all those people go who have nobody to fend for them? Do you know that they have a very serious body part selling operation going on in many of these major cities around the country? And a lot of it involves homeless people and child abductions. We're talking Ramadan. It's time for the remedy. You heard of the Atlantic killings. That was just a small piece of that puzzle that they created where children used to end up on the, on the front of milk carton. Do you remember that? Well, you think all of that operation just ceased and desist because they don't talk about it anymore in the media? They have more child abductions now, child slave rings, slavery rings. They just rescued some a couple of years ago in South Carolina, right here in my backyard. I'm in North Carolina where the police released, uh, captured the, the, the bad guys and released a, 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 a dozens of children that they were keeping in underground cities. You don't know about that either, do you? Underground cities. They have an underground city right there in New York City, especially in the Harlem, New York area. There are underground tunnels and underground cities with lights and electricity and everything running under there. And you'd be surprised. That guy over there who was operating that island, Jeffrey, Jeffrey Epstein, whatever his name was, 
he had underground tunnels that took them from land to land. They didn't have to get in a boat to go across the island. They used to go underground, driving underground. And they would bring those children there. They would do what they wanted to do. Not going to name the names of the people who are on that list, but you pretty much know who we're talking about. Doing some vile and disgusting things with the world's children because the children are innocent. Many of them are runaways. Many of them think they're going to become famous if they buddy up with this guy and sleep with him maybe for a day or two or you know, whatever, become his girl or whatever. They think they're going to become famous and rich. And the exact opposite happens. And a lot of times it enters or uh, uh, ends up with uh, them being cast away and even murdered in many cases. Now, this is real stuff I'm talking. These are the things we have to guard against. And you can't guard against them unless you yourself are dedicated to the self, to the obligation that your soul has upon itself. Alaikum and husukum and husakum. Your own soul obligates you to be way away from that foolishness and to do what you can to put a dent in that operation if you can't tear the whole thing down altogether. That's what your so-called Black community is supposed to be talking about because many of those children are so-called Black, so-called African-American from poor neighborhoods. There are people who will, during that crack period, especially in the 80s, they used to sell their children to these people for crack. And a lot of you already know that. And these social conspirators, they have such a humongous plan coming behind this so-called COVID-19 epidemic. Oh, what a masterful plan. They think that they're going to be able to effectuate. But I know in my heart of hearts that Allah is not about to step in. He's already stepping in. Like Imam Muhammad said, I know what they say about the new world order. I'm telling you that Allah is going to bring out, he's going to advance his new world order using their hands. Now, does that mean that you kick back and do nothing and just let it happen? Oh, it's not really evil. It's really Allah. No, no, no. That's not what that means. That means that when you know better, you're supposed to do better. And if you can't do better with your hands, you're supposed to do better with your tongue. You have to teach against it. And just hating it in your heart, as your hadith says, is the least of faith. It's the least part of the iman. All right, let's move on. Hope everybody's all right. So the Ramadan represents the ease and the Maradan represents the dis-ease. Now in the Quran, Allah says that Maryam vowed a fast, quote unquote, against speaking to any nafs, to any soul. You see how Allah uses the word sound in the Quran, in Surah 19, Maryam? He says that she vowed, a, in fact, he has her saying it, I vow a fast to Allah that I will not speak to any individual for three days except through gestures. <laughs> but she was instructed immediately after that to eat and drink. So how could saum mean abstinence from food, drink, and sex? Think about that. Saum is not fasting from eating and drinking. Saum is a commitment to the action of being and remaining steadfast in an effort to increase your levels of iman, bringing your spiritual life, your spiritual integrity up to the point where you no longer have to think about being good. You've been good for so long, repetitively, over and over again, that it has become second nature to you. You don't need your man, your mind anymore. The ah man has kicked in. The not mind. It's not your mind now. It's in your soul. It's in your biology now. It's in your cellular structure to do good. Be good, do good, think good, or die. I'm not worth it's not worth living if I'm not going to be what Allah intended for me to be. That's Iman. So that is what Ramadan is supposed to be about. However, the majority of the Muslim world has strayed way, way, way away from this original meaning. Nunetics is here to assist the Muslim world and the common people of the world 
to return to this very important connection with the fitra. Now the word siam is not the plural of saum, as many of the scholars have purported. It is the doer of the continuous action of exhibiting determination and decisiveness in the effort to establish and increase faith. That's what siam is. That's what Psalm is. Psalm is the thing. Siam is the doer of Psalm. That means that if you are about the continuous action of exhibiting steadfastness in what Allah asked you to do and stay away from and participate in, but it has to be what the guidance is instructing you to do. And you have to, you can't be sometimes with it. You can't be, I'll do it this year, but hey, I'll do it next year. See, I'll make dua to Allah. I'll meditate, you know, this month, but hey, I'm not going to meditate after that. I'll wait till next time this year, you know. See, that sometimes you're not going to build a man upon that weak platform. It won't stand. Now let's talk about the proto root for both the words Psalm and Siam. The proto root is Saud Mim Mim Sam. And it is what forms the action. So let's look at this carefully. Psalm is the noun that is the thing. It is the thing. Siam with its extended vowel sound, is the doer of a continuous action. See, yeah. It's continuous. It's flowing. It's always in action and adventure in support of its action. It's not sometimes. -y. When you're performing CM, you're doing it on a regular. You're not doing it for 30 months out of the year during a particular month. That's not what you're doing. You're doing it every time the situation and the condition calls for it. When Elijah Muhammad, <laughs> may our God rest his soul, forgive him his sins. Huh? When Elijah Muhammad was told by his teacher, W.D. Farad, may God rest his soul, forgive him his sins. When he was told that we're going to practice Ramadan amongst the black Muslims, our community group amongst the so-called Negroes, we're not going to do it along with what the Muslim world is doing. We're going to practice Ramadan in December. Y'all remember that? He said, let's fast in December. And he had a great reason for it. He said, first of all, the days are much shorter. Yeah, you know, sun comes up and a few hours later, the sun is on its way down. That was mercy for people who were not in the habit of fasting for 16 hours a day and a hundred and something degree heat. See, he didn't want to put us into that. I'm sure Mr. Farad must have peeped in the Quran about Ramadan that Allah says that he does not intend hardship for you. He, he wants ease for you. So Farad said, well, let me find a month that represents that ease. Oh, I know, December. And then we can uh, feed two birds with one stone because that's when most of these Negroes are celebrating Christmas, a pagan holiday. So we can, we can, you know, feed two birds with one stone. We can have them complete their Ramadan fast in December, and we can gradually move them away from this pagan practice of worshiping something other than Allah. Now, I don't know if Mr. Farad was thinking all that because he instituted something that ended up worshiping something other than Allah. So life and its graduations are gradual. They don't happen overnight and no one person comes with the complete key to the, all of the doors. Mr. Farad came with keys to some of them and some of the keys didn't work. But my point is, is that he was calling himself instituting Ramadan during a time of year that was palatable for us to practice, who were recently out of, out of slavery, recently out of being hung by the necks in the South and in the North at a whopping 50 hangings per day during the 50 years or so of Jim Crow per day. There were minimum 50 so-called black people hung up on trees, burned at the stake, 
while white people were around having parties, drinking lemonade and liquor and having their grandchildren on their shoulders, watching and smelling our burning bodies burn. That kind of people. Can you imagine the impact upon the psyche of the people who are witnessing this and the victims of this? You can't imagine that. So you over there where you're from, you need to stop talking bad about Elijah Muhammad because you don't know the power and the wisdom that Allah has in correcting a situation that many people should have stepped up and been courageous enough to uh, correct, but they didn't. So Allah steps in with his, with his rahmah. And of course, you don't like the way the baby looks in the womb. If you took it out of the womb before it was fully developed, you say, oh, oh that's ugly. That baby looks like a tadpole. What in the world? This ain't no human. Well, that's what they said about the nation of Islam and, you know, what happened during Malcolm's Day. All of that was a part of the growth and development of a people that Allah was conditioning for world leadership. You want more proof of that? You're looking at him. I'm from that experience. I was never a technical part of the nation of Islam, but I began my study of Islam by studying books by Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm X or Malcolm Shabazz. Allah didn't allow me to become a registered member of the Nation of Islam, but I was in the Temple of Harlem, 116th Street, every Friday, and sometimes Wednesdays and Sundays. Three times a week, they asked us to be at the mosque or the temple, as they called it at that time. But the temple, we found out, was just temporary. And it was meant to help us adjust to the temple, the temple that was incrementally marching us towards the Quran. Instructor Bilal. Yes. Your, your situation in the nation, not being in it co completely, similar to Imam Wafdi Muhammad, it's similar. He, Allah kept him out to a certain degree until a certain time. And then when he came in, he corrected things. I would agree with that. There are vast similarities between his life and circumstances and mine, although they are drastically different. But you're absolutely right. In many regards, we share like circumstances. I appreciate you for acknowledging that. All right. Let's get through. We're almost finished. So we're talking about proto-roots. I'm going to explain exactly what that means in a minute. But that word sam, S-A-M-M, -M, It is what forms the action called S-A-W-M, Saum. Now you'll notice that Saum has three consonants, the sod, the wow in the middle, and then the meme, whereas Sam has two consonants. That's what makes it a proto-root. Proto-roots always only have two consonants. Sod and meme, although the meme is doubled, and I explained in this morning's class why the ancient Arab linguists doubled certain consonants in their words, like um, the, the word for mother. It was originally just alif meme, like it is in Hebrew. The Hebrews say am for mother, am and amma. But somehow the Arabic linguists figured out that there were some sneaky conniving people who were bent on manipulating language and making it say what they wanted it to say. So what they did was they locked in the integrity of certain words and what they wanted them to mean forever by simply adding a third or a doubling of a consonant. So there are three consonants here, sod, meme, meme, but one is simply double. And when you double it, it leaves no room for devilish people to add another consonant different from these because it would render this word to mean something totally different. And when the ancient Arabs saw four consonants as the root letters, they say, uh-uh, Allah could not have revealed that. Or our language does not support that if it were before the Quran was revealed. Our language doesn't support that kind of word construction. So they were masters of language. Ancient Arabs had really nothing better to do than concentrate on the building up and fortifying of their language. So the proto-root Sam alludes to being steadfast. It is addressing the faith, the Iman, and is indicating that we should be steadfast and disciplined when it comes to adhering to the faith. 
Let's see how. Sam is the source of both the words Saum and Siam, and it means to be decisive, to be determined, to make up one's mind, to be unchanged, to be perseverant, and listen, to be deaf to any deviation. I've made up my mind, right? And I'm not going to change. The word summun in the Quran, where Allah says summun bukmun umyun. Deaf, dumb, blind. They will not return to the path. So summun means deaf. You see the connection now? Summun is from the same root letters as sam and saum and siam, the same consonantal sounds of the S and the M. The UN on summun is a suffix. And it means, again, to be deaf. Now, how are we connecting that? If we are being steadfast in our position and someone tries to change our mind, we say, I don't want to hear it. You might as well stop talking. See, when they stop talking, you can't hear them. If you cover your ears and say, I don't want to hear that. I'm already fixed in my belief system, in my way, in my judgment of this. I'm with Allah and what he says. I don't even want to hear what you got to say if it's against what the guidance says. See? Sam. We even say in the ritual set, Sami Allahu Liman Hamida, that Allah has heard those who praise him. Sami heard hearing. You get it? Fasting was not prescribed for you, according to the English translation by Yusuf Ali. He says, fasting was prescribed for you as it was prescribed for those before you. That's not what it means. Fasting, saum or siam, either one, was not prescribed for you. It was inscribed upon you. Kutiba alaykum are the words that Allah is using. And again, because it has alaykum, you now know and should always remember that alaykum is tied to the obligation or to the responsibility of someone upon something or someone else. Kataba, which kutiba comes from, the root word kataba is the root of the word book. As you know, we say kitab means book. Thalik al kitabu la raiba fihi, right? That is the book. There is no doubt in it. So kitab is an age-old word that has been translated as book all throughout the Arabic-speaking world. But it is not a book necessarily that's written in pen or typewriter. It is a book that is written in permanent carvings. You need to research the history of the first known writing in history called cuneiform in what is called uh, Mesopotamia. Cuneiform, C-U-N-E-I-F-O-R-M. That's the first recognized writing upon clay tablets. And of course, if it were upon clay tablet, tablet, tablets, pardon me, it had to be carved in strokes and those kinds of things, right? No cursive writing. It had to be carved in stone. That's why they say when they talk about something being carved in stone, they mean it's permanent. That's what kitab means. A book, yes, but a book of permanent writing, permanent carvings. You can't just go in there and make it what you want it to be. Then it's no longer Allah's kitab. It's your kitab. Allah's kitab has information in it, ayat in it, surahs in it, that can't be changed by man because Allah inscribed them. Let's look a little bit closer at this word, kataba. So it is a book written in permanent carvings. Just like when you carve your heart and your name on the side of a tree, Johnny loves Judy or whatever, you know, you come back 10 years later, other things have changed in the environment, but if the tree is still standing, your carvings stand also because it's etched 
it's carved with a sharp object. You see? If it were in lead on a piece of paper, anything could happen to it. You could spill coffee on it and the writing would be diminished or eliminated. Same thing with a pen or pencil or a magic marker even. You can spill something on it. it can, you can crumble it up and throw it in the garbage can. That's not what a kitab is. Kitab is a book of information that you can't just go in and start willy-nilly making the changes and the modifications that you see fit to make. It doesn't work like that. Not with Allah's kitab. Kitab Allah. Kitab al library. Yeah, they make them changes. They type that on a typewriter or on a computer or whatever. And they printed it out and Xeroxed it and all that. That's different than what we're talking about. Allah's kitab is etched in stone, if you will. And it represents permanent markings. Now let's see the origin of these permanent markings as Allah has established them in his fitrah. It means a book in the same way that the courts use the word book to mean that you have been held to the judgment of an authority upon you. Remember that? Uh, what is that? The uh, I don't think it went television show that was FBI or whatever. They said, book them down, old. <laughs> yeah. Man, when you have to be held accountable, And fusakum alaykum, your souls are holding you accountable. It's because Allah has inscribed something upon the fabric of your nafs itself. You want to know what that is? Check the Quran when Allah tells you that he, he, he uh, addressed every nafs that would ever come into existence. And he asked them the one question, am I not your rabb? And they all said, but uh, of course, how can you even ask us that? You know, let's see, <laughs> you think we dumb or something? And Allah says that he asked us that so that at the end of this journey of human life, he said we would have no excuses. Oh, man, how wonderful is that? We wouldn't be able to say, I didn't know. No, Allah clocked that into your soul, into your nafs as a permanent marking. You get it? So where is that kitab? It's inside here. And the prototype of it is also inside here, biologically speaking. Let's look at this. There is a permanent carving which represents the book called our physical body. And it exists within the DNA, RNA makeup and is called our genetic code, which is related to the bigger word codify or codify, which shares consonantal connections with the word kataba. The C is a K sound in codify, interchanges with the K in kataba. The D interchanges with the T in kataba. And the B as a labial interchanges with the F in codify. So codify and kataba are kissing cousins. Because your DNA, RNA makeup is cold language. And right now, everybody in the computer field is preoccupied with learning code because they're marching to the beat of Allah's drummer, even though they think they're marching to the beat of their own drummer. What did Imam Muhammad say? Don't worry about what they say about the new world order. Allah is going to bring in his new world order using their hands. So their hands are the hands that are going to be dirty and sinful. All you have to do is just keep your righteousness up. And that righteousness is not in turning your faces east or west, not in turning your faces towards Mecca or Jerusalem. That's really what Allah is. It's not in your rituals. You think that makes you righteous? And when you walk into Mecca, you say, well, I have my compass. Let's see which way is the east or northeast. We got to make our salat, our ritual. You're paying all of that attention to ritual. You think that Allah is more in the direction of Mecca than he is in the direction of Harlem? You think Mecca is the holy city and being there gained you so many barakats. But being in Louisiana, sorry, buddy, it's just a matter of where you were born. You weren't favored like us to, live, to be born in the holy city of Mecca or to visit the precincts of Medina. 
what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? He says, the entire earth is my masjid. So what are you clamoring to be at some masjid in one part of the world, in one particular city? You have made those people so big-headed and egotistical about their Arabness that part of it is your fault. The great majority of it is the fault of those people who knew what they were doing. They knew they were scheming. But some of the responsibility is alayka upon you and alaykum upon all of you. Part of that responsibility because your own soul obligates you. Your, your soul. Instructor, a culprit yes. has, to, has to have a willing participant we call victim. <laughs> yeah, there you go. It's always two-sided, right? Yeah. So you can't just be doing, 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 and, and you're getting the brunt of it and you're not even stopping to think, why is he, why is he victimizing me? But sometimes the victim remains the victim because they get used to being victimized. So the Quran comes to bust up that scheme. And Ramadan is one of the means and measures that Allah uses to bust up the scheme that has been keeping the entire world asleep and worse than that, keeping the entire world sick. So we're talking now about the inscription, the kataba, the carving that Allah has placed within the human being's very DNA biology. There's a kitab in you. There's a kitab in me that has permanent markings that we call DNA components written by Allah that are responsible for our very genetic intelligence. We're about to go just a little bit deep and then I'm going to take you off of the water, put you back on the shore and let you go home. You'll be a little wet, but you'll be able to go home. Allah established the original book of DNA codes, but the social conspirators sought to, quote, write the book with their own hands and say, this is from Allah. And does that sound familiar? See, the conspirators sought to do that. Not just talking about physical book being physically changed. It's talking about the book called your coded DNA RNA blueprint that they were seeking for many, many generations, hopefully to get in there to begin to rewrite the codes that regulate your human life and behavior. So when they pop up all of a sudden talking about they have some artificially laboratory created RNA, mRNA, that they're going to implant into you via a jab, via a so-called so vaccine, and most people don't even know that the word vaccine is referring to cattle. That's for your study. <laughs> so here they're talking about they have something that's actually going to alter the condition of your MRA. They're going to take that off the scene. Hey, take your bow. This is your last scene. We're going to put our new actor out there. We don't have to pay him as much as we pay you. You're getting old anyway. Get out of here. Let's bring our new actor on. The laboratory created mRNA. And it's going to do what we program it to do. Forget whether you believe in a God, really. You think God is in control of the genes. You've got to be out of your mind. We're in control of the genetics now. Time for God to rest. Isn't this the seventh day? Tell God, go take a break. There's their attitude, these arrogant sons of you know what. That's their attitude. Now, that's the book also, the more important book that they change with their own hands. And then they say, well, this is how Allah intended it. Allah gave us the freedom to change the genetics. If we can find a better way of the genetics operating, then we're supposed to have permission. I mean, God would give us permission to make these modifications. I mean, he didn't perfect it. He left enough room for us to perfect it. Allah didn't cut my front lawn. He left enough latitude for me to get a lawnmower, invent a lawnmower and make my lawn look nice. So am I wrong? Am I going against God by cutting my lawn? If I leave it the way he designed it, my whole house will be covered with grass. <laughs> that's, their, that's their warped logic speaking to you. 
the grass over growing in your lawn will be taken care of by various measures. Your common sense will eventually kick in and say, my house is going to be overridden. But guess what? Even if the grass grew tall enough to reach your top window, it's not causing harm to your house. It's just unsightly in your estimation. <laughs> In the estimation of the jungle, it's just fine. This is what leaves and grass and trees do. But when they alter your very mRNA, and really they're altering alongside that your DNA without telling you, then you are going to be in for some travesty. You're going to be in for some disastrous results that could last for many more generations than you will exist and live in. That's my message and that's my warning. And Allah advises us to not only be bringers of good news, but also of a warning. So understand that. So that is what genetic manipulation is all about. Writing the book with their own hands. Allah says, Waylon, whoa. In English, we have the term wailing. We used to hit our little bad children when they did something. We spank them on the bottom and they start wailing like their life is in danger. You know, my father's going to kill God. Daddy, mommy, don't daddy. But that's wailing. Well, imagine that on the broader scale of Allah putting that punishment on the wrongdoers who are manipulating our DNA and also changing the words of Allah's scriptures to say what they wanted it to say that would favor their particular ethnic group by making you believe that their ethnic group are the de facto children of God or the de facto family of God. Whether it's Jesus Christ being the son of God and we look like Jesus Christ in the face or us being the chosen people of God to the exclusion of all other people because we're Jews or whatever we're saying we are that other people can't be, unless they're born through a Jewish womb, then they can be a Jew. If not, you can't convert to this religion, buddy. Nothing in the Torah says that. That lack of reasoning is found in the rabbinical writings called the Talmud. And if you see words in the Bible, in the Old Testament that suggests that the Jews are the chosen people, you're not understanding what Jew means in the Bible. You're not understanding what that word means and how it is to be placed in the human framework. When you read the term, God is the Lord of Israel, and you understand that to mean to the exclusion of all other people. Now you know why the Quran had to come and say that Allah is the Rabb of al Alameen. He's the evolver, the creator, the evolver, the sustainer of all people, of all nations. He's not just the Rabb of Israel. He's the Rabb of the cosmos, everything in it. al Alameen, all systems, all of the knowledge bodies that give us information from studying the system. Allah is the one who is evolving that knowledge. For who? For Anas. That's a part of the Hudan. The difference between prophets and messengers will be addressed in an upcoming weekend via the Masjid Allah portal during this Ramadan. Just know that it is the same difference as your DNA, which receives the initial instructions. Think about that. Your DNA is programmed directly by your rub. And the RNA is called the messenger gene. You get it now? DNA represents the prophets that receive the initial instructions, the initial book, if you will. <laughs> and then the RNA replicates the message and keeps it in vogue. And they call the RNA in science, the messenger gene. It replicates the instructions. So the messengers don't come with uh, a new book. The messengers come to reinforce the message that had already been delivered. So you tell me the Quran is not the most fitra-based book on planet Earth as we speak. 
you think you're reading about cartoon characters. Oh, the prophet did this and the prophet did that and the messengers did this and the messengers did that. When you start reading the Quran now, beginning this Ramadan, and you come across those words, Nabi and Rasul, you're going to understand that it is also referring to your very genetic makeup and its origin and its functionality, its form and its functionality, its fitra. The Quran is fitra language. It's not man-made language. It's the language of the cosmos. It's the language of mother nature, if you will. And only Allah can take the credit for its creation. The science within the Quran is so way above the so-called science of this world is what you need to understand. Within your body are parent cells and what are called the soma cells. Now let us examine the difference between what science calls parent cells, which are the original cells that every human being is born with as a part of their biology. And let's see where soma cells get introduced into this equation. Parent cells are those original cells that are under the direct command of your native intelligence, meaning your native DNA. Those are parent cells. In the Quran, I want you to think deep now. In Surah 17, Bani Israel, Allah says to all of us to treat our parents a particular way and to do not say to them any such word of discord or, he says, don't even say ufun. You know that ufun, yeah, you can get away from, get off, say ufun, off, get off, <laughs> get away from me, mommy. <laughs> You didn't give me that money to go to the movies. I'm mad at you. That's how some children talk to their parents now. I don't want to hear from you, mom. I'm going to my head, go in the room and close, shut the door. Bam! And the mother's still out there. I didn't mean to say it like that. I was just trying to say. And the mother becomes a child. The child becomes a parent. Allah says to us, do not treat your... See, in Allah telling us not to treat our parents like that, he's preserving the interest of our fitrah. Your fitra works against that. Your nervous system will work against that behavior, whether you know it or believe it or not. But it is also speaking about the parent that I'm now discussing as the parent cell. The first cells receiving the firstborn intelligence, the innate intelligence that Allah clocked into that fabric of gene. No parent put that there. No teacher, no scholar put the initial intelligence into the cell of the biology. Only Allah is responsible for that initial set of commands. That's what they are. It's what makes you eat when you're hungry. It's what makes you drink when you're thirsty. It's what makes you do everything that your instincts propel you to do. That's your native intelligence. And they come here first, I repeat, as your parent cells. Then you have your soma cells. This is so interesting. Listen carefully. Your soma cells, S-O-M-A, interesting. Same consonants as some. And C-M, I think we're getting somewhere now. And the Greeks gave us this word, and they simply say that it means your body, your physical body. Well, I mean, if soma cells are just merely your physical body, what in the world are parent cells? Aren't they also part of your physical body? See how they hide the wisdom. So soma cells develop once the baby is delivered and begins to take in information from the environment, see? not just from the DNA information that Allah clocked there. The soma cells are now registering 
the environment and what it is impacting upon you upon, from through by way of your five senses. See, you begin to smell different things outside of the womb, outside when you delivered and hear different things and taste and touch different things. See, so you see different things than you saw when you were in the womb. You didn't see anything in the womb. So now you have a bombardment of information coming towards you, coming at you, being absorbed by your five basic senses. And they are creating another layer of cellular development above and beyond the parent cells that science calls soma cells. Soma cells are designed to absorb not only what the parent cells are providing for it as innate information, but also what the environment is creating for it as what is called mimetic information information from the means in the environment, the information in the environment. Now, if the information in the environment that is creating your soma cells, and every time you receive information over and over again, the soma cells that develop that are based on that information, <coughs> if the information, pardon me, excuse me, if the information is repeated over and over again, I should have had a cup of water here waiting for me, but one moment. If that information is repeated continuously, then the soma cells take it upon themselves to say, this is what master wants. So let us now go to work and bring into existence what these soma cells have been introduced to repetitively. So if you start to concentrate on evil doings, evil deeds, looking at things haram and all the rest of that stuff, then the soma cells will believe that that's the life that you're desiring and they will bring you more like it. Now I'm trying to tell you how trouble gets established in the human psyche. It's because of what's going on within your very cellular makeup your soma cells are beginning to call for anything that you condone that you're allowing in from the environment. That's why babies can twerk at two years old. That's why children can cuss worse than a sailor at five and six and seven and 10 years old because they've been in that environment for so long that they've convinced their soma cells that this is the right thing to do. This is normal. The cells don't know that it is not natural. The cells have been trained to see that as being normal, the norm. And norms can be altered at will. So they are your parent cells that are crying for respect. <laughs> but the soma cells come in and say, F you, you're not the boss of me. This guy's mind is controlling me. And he keeps paying all of this attention to all of these things that you say are not good for me. But whatever I pay attention to is going to expand because my boss says so. So whatever he pays attention to, that expands. And whatever expands is what I'm going to be witnessing on a day-to-day -day basis. And if that's what he wants, by golly, I'm his genie. Did you get it? Gene, genie. It's the soma cells and the genes within them that are now following the command and bringing that thing into your reality. Ask and it is given. Knock and it shall be opened, so says the Bible. The Quran says that the believer gets what he, what he, uh, uh, what he works for, what he strives for. The faithful person, the iman, the mu'min, he gets what he strives for. And that you should know that your striving will soon produce for you. What it's saying in actuality is that it's already done. It's done deal with Allah. If you're striving for it, Allah already knows ahead of time whether you're going to pass the test and he's already got it waiting in the cut, as they say. So all you got to do is just keep striving, keep praying, keep doing what you do, keep being good, keep doing all of the things that you know are in Allah's favor. And that thing is guaranteed. And I've been telling you that in many ways, more than one way for weeks and months and maybe a few years now. That's how I know Lunetics is going to be the chief. <laughs> it's just a short period of time. The king of academics in this world. Not just this country. This world. Because it's the only language system that links all other languages as one world language. 
So this information will begin fashioning the child's intellect and can do so in a way which deviates from fitra-based intelligence. Remember that hadith, I repeated it earlier. Every infant is born alel fitra, upon the fitra, and it is his parents beginning, uh, pardon me, it is his environment beginning with his parents that take it off of the course of his fitra-based journey. So it's the environment doing that. And it's the environment feeding that false information to the soma cells. And the soma cells are acquiescing by this time. The parent cells are weaker than the soma cells in the same way that as you grow older as the child, your parents grow to be weaker than you. So Allah says, don't even say to them, get off of me. See, it's also talking to the soma cells about how they should be treating your parent cells. It's also talking to the environmental stimuli that you're letting in so that you will be more cautious and careful about the information that you're allowing into your five basic senses from the world, from the environment. If you're careful about that, then the soma cells are in the perfect, perfect situation and condition to advise, to uh, cajole, to care for the parent cells. And the only thing Allah asks the parent cells to do is not ask the soma cells, the child, to do anything outside of what Allah has advised. I'm paraphrasing, but you know the, you know the ayat, it's in Surah 17. Okay? It says, if they ask you to do anything that Allah, that, that you are not aware of, that's the way it puts it, anything that you question, you don't know if that's what you should do. It didn't say if they ask you to do something devious. It might not be devious. It's just that you are not aware of that thing. You're not clear on whether that's allowed for you or not. Then Allah says, don't obey them in that, but go on and keep good company with them. You see how Allah does? He's rejoining, he's reuniting the excellence and the essence of both your parent cells and your soma cells so that they can exist as Allah intended them to exist where the environment does not become your master or your massa, depending on what group of people you stem from. Don't let the environment be your massa or your master. Allah is Maliki Yawmiddin, the master of all of this. I hope you understand that. Let's continue. The role of Ramadan is to reunite the intellect with the intelligence. This is done through the disciplining of our physical, mental, emotional, moral, and spiritual appetites. All of those layers of human development are related and intertwined like the DNA strand. They are all interwoven into each other. And one cannot operate successfully without depending on the other. Your physical body cannot operate independent of your mental body. Your mental body is sending the commands to what your arm should be doing. Your fingers, your, your toes, your torso, your, even your heartbeat and its rate. Your mind can speed up your heartbeat just by thinking about something fearful or something exciting, something you're looking forward to. Your heart begins to skip, as they say, when you see the girl that you've been waiting to see all week long. In seventh grade, you go to school, and forget the teacher, forget the homework and the lessons. I'll do all of that just to impress the girl. And every time I think about it, oh, you know, my heart skips a beat, they say, skips a beat. <laughs> right? So your mind and your emotions are doing that to your biology. Our computers and our cell phones are now feeding us our apps. And apps is simply a code word for appetites. Isn't that interesting that we call them cell phones? You don't think they have any impact upon your soma cells? These people designed this world in a way that they thought we would never be able to calculate, figure out, take apart, and dismantle. That's what they were thinking. So our computers are programmed and they have created human life now as one gigantic computer that can be shut down at will. It happened during COVID. They shut the whole human computer down. 
and said, you need, you need a new programming. You got too many alternate programs running in you. You socialize too much. You talk too much on YouTube. You're creating scholarship by people sitting in front of their computers, learning things that they would have never learned in a classroom. We got to shut this down. We have to be the ones to think for you now. If you say anything that goes against our spiel, we're going to ban you. We're going to shut you down. I don't care if you're a doctor with 15 degrees up the kazoo. We're not going to take your advice on medical issues because it doesn't agree with our party line. So we're going to shut you down, take your YouTube channel away from you. You know, you know what they did. Thousands of doctors had to get together and sign a petition against that foolishness. How come we didn't have public debates about this coronavirus when you first introduced it? What is a knucklehead like Bill Gates doing, making the final decision on what to do about a virus? And he's not a medical person. He's not a doctor. And he couldn't even get the damn virus out of his computer. How's he going to get it out of humanity? Then he comes behind it to tell us that he was wrong. It wasn't as bad as we said it was going to be, or it's not as an emergency. It's not an emergency situation like we painted the picture to be. It's just, he said it's really was no, he said it really was no more than the common seasonal flu. Bill Gates said that, not me. Don't get mad at me. Because you went around with a mask every day, depriving yourself of God's oxygen, depriving yourself of God's fitron, depriving yourself of an individual identity in the world. When people only see you from the eyes up, your personality disappears. Your personality is from the nose down. When you smile, when you frown, people know what you're thinking sometimes, what you're feeling sometimes. But if they don't have access to that, they don't have access to you. And then you're afraid to speak to people. You're afraid to get too close to people. Six feet away. Are you six feet away? That's the code language for six feet under. You know what that means. Why didn't they say five feet away? Why didn't they say seven feet away? If they really want to be cautious and take precautions, why didn't they say 12 feet away? Stand 12 feet away. They could have marked the supermarkets and put the tape down and measured out eight feet, 10 feet, if they really wanted to be sure. But all of it was Masonic uh, code language that they use in those secret clubs when they meet with each other, the Bilderbergs and the Rockefellers and those people. That's their symbolic language. They were telling each other, we're going to put these people six feet under when this whole scheme is over and done because we are set out and dead set out to depopulate planet Earth by however many percentages. We're going to do that. There are too many people on Earth, especially these wasted people over there in Africa, Biafra and these places like that, and Ethiopia and Eritrea. Yeah, if we clean those lands out, man, we can repopulate that with some of our folks and let them live the high life, keep a few servants just to do everything we need for them to do. We're not going to get rid of everybody. We'll get rid of the majority and then we'll keep the minority as our personal servants and slaves. Now, if you don't think that's the plan, you haven't been keeping up with the real news. You've been keeping up with CNN and them dumb folks. And those liars, many of whom don't even know they're lying. They're just following the lines that they're given, reading the same lines on CNN that they're reading on NBC, CBS, CNBC, ABC. When you switch channels on that same night, you're going to find all of them repeating exactly the same words that they have been given a script for. That's well, the, pre the president of the United States... Uh... He called mainstream media fake news. I'm just saying what I heard. Well, yeah, that was President Trump when he was president. Yeah. But they're all a part of fake news. <laughs> it's morning. I know, but they can't shake that, what he put on them by saying it out publicly. They, they're they never going to be the same again. Well, this is why a lot, part of me, this is why Imam Muhammad said that I know what they're saying about the new world order. 
But Allah is going to bring about his new world order through their hands. So when they slip and say things like that, or when they get angry enough at somebody to say, I'm going to let a piece of this plan of yours or of ours slip out. And Allah takes that vibration. He takes that frequency and he makes it do his work in the world. So now everybody has fake news coming off of their lips. He might not have known it was going to go that far, but it did. And it is absolutely the truth. But I'm saying that without showing any favoritism towards any red or blue party or in-between party. All right? We're of Allah's party. Allah has a party called Hezbollah in the Quran. The party of Allah. Not that political group doing all that damage in the Middle East. Hezbollah. No. They stole that phrase from the Quran. Hezbollah. The party of Allah. That's the party we belong to. And it's not red or blue. Let's keep going. Oh, that is where I intended to stop. I'm going to continue with this conversation uh, next Saturday in the Masjid Law class. So I'm going to stop there and I'm going to open up uh, just for a few questions. I know it's getting late on us. Uh, however, I did promise that I would answer or at least allow you to say a few things. You might just want to give greetings and you know talk about how you enjoyed the lecture or you might have specific questions regarding Ramadan or anything associated with Ramadan that you wanted to know. Uh, I'm not going to answer any questions that are just too deep to answer because I don't wanna be here another 30 minutes, hour and that kind of thing. So we'll skip those heavy ones and you'll email them to me and I promise you I will email you back an answer. So shoot something light, uh, a word that you didn't understand or would like to understand better and that kind of thing. Let me just look very quickly through these comments to see if there are any questions here. No, it's just corroborating some of the things that I've said. Yeah, so there are no. Uh, yeah. So Winona, she had some- I kept making mistakes. So go down about three. <laughs> okay, hold on, wait, wait, wait. Here, uh, please comment that one. Yes. Yes. We so fisu dur in nas. Minalaginati when nas. Please comment. Okay. That's talking about what's called the whisperer, the subtle whisperer who whispers into the sudur of an nas, the humanity that we've been discussing. So the West West is considered by the scholars to be an epithet of Satan himself and because of that, they see Satan as being the one who whispers into the sudur. Now, without getting into all of the technical stuff and what the sudur is and talking about all of that again, I think it suffices to say that the breast area or the chest area, the torso, remember, we consonantally connected it to sudur, torso, same consonants, that it is protecting a particular area is protecting that area. So you have to look beneath the skin, beneath the skeleton, and look at the precious vital organs that the sudur is charged by Allah to protect. The main ones are the heart, and we speak about the heart as emotionality on the higher level of understanding. The lungs are there, a pair of lungs. We speak about the lungs and the breathing as being a spiritual quality and connection. So what it is saying, if you only understood those two things about those major organs within the sudur, you should know that the influences of what we are calling the devil or shaitan or the whisperer, the influences of that whisperer are going to be in the areas of your emotionality or your sensitivities and also of your spirituality or your hidden influences, your invisible influences. So you need to begin looking very carefully at both of those aspects of your life. How am I feeling and why am I feeling like this? I never thought this negative way about this person before. Why am I thinking like this? Or oh, it might be something somebody whispered in another YouTube video. Instructor Benjamin Bilal doesn't like Imam Muhammad. He's talking against Imam Muhammad. You might have heard that. A lot of people heard that, but he whispered it. Now, what makes it a whisper? He said it in front of a microphone and in front of an audience of however many dozens of people. How is it a whisper? Because he didn't call me and tell me directly. 
That's what the West West does. He just to the people closest. You can't whisper to people all the way down there. You have to whisper to people who are close to you. And if he's close to you, then he's probably your buddy, <laughs> your chum. You don't go whispering into the ears of strangers. They'll think you're a pervert. You whisper into the ears of people who are close to you. Yo, let me, let me bend your ear for a minute, Ock. Did you hear this man? I got a fun fancy What do you think about that? Oh, really? Yeah, I'm about to put a major YouTube video out, man. And, you know, spread the word that I'm going to be talking about his lecture that he gave and what he said about Ali man and blah, blah. Well, how come I never got a call? Muslim is supposed to love for his brother what he loves for himself. And you're supposed to correct your brother when he's in the right and when he's in the wrong, according to your hadith. Right or wrong, you're supposed to say, wait a minute, you. brother, you're going to, hold on, you're going to hurt somebody who's talking like you talk or you can get yourself hurt. Let me just tell you, I'd have been there and done that and I got that t-shirt to prove it. So listen to what I'm saying. I'm your brother. I care for you. I love you. I don't even know you, but I've never heard anything bad about you. So let me be the first to pick up my phone or text you. If I'm scared to pick up the phone and talk to you, let me text you then. But don't be whispering so that it's like that telephone thing that people whisper in this ear. What happens by the time it gets to the 50th ear, the 100th ear? It's not even what you said. And what you said was bad enough. It's worse now. <laughs> you understand? So that's what was was is. And it happens in two major ways by people whispering into your sensitivities, the things that they know you feel strongly about. Imam Muhammad, he say he knows you feel strongly about him. Or it'd be about your wife or your best friend or somebody that they know you care for. They'll start whispering, well, I don't know why you're still with that nigga because, you know, Charlie saw that nigga with another woman at the, at the supermarket. And he was all laughing and playing and pushing her and all that. My husband, yeah, your husband, but he call her baby now. Your husband, baby. <laughs> he come to find out that's his first cousin. <laughs> that's just Check. his first cousin he hadn't seen in years. They planning on being at the picnic together. And the wife knows her, but she doesn't know that's what he was talking about. That's what the was. She hears it. That's what that is. And he whispers into that. And that influence comes from both Nas, meaning the curious-minded people, who are truly trying to learn something new, but they're also nosy. See, nice and nosy. And it can graduate to become the nasty people, not just nasty. They can become nasty in their attitudes. And that happens from amongst the jinn, meaning the people who are manipulating you genetically, those invisible forces. And it can also happen from the people who have some kind of brain, you know, like the, the cowardly, Ooh, no, the scarecrow said in the Wizard of Oz, if I only had a brain, see? <laughs> so it could happen from both spectrums. So be careful of both. That's what that means. I hope I satisfied your question. Abdul, you want to say something? Yeah, it seems like they always work with kind of intelligence. COINTELPRO. That's what it stands for. You know, whether they- Intelligence program. But another thing I want to say about the um, the Mazafi coons that have, um, you said that, they couldn't corrupt the, the letters or the language of a Arabic, but they changed the meaning. Yes. Yeah. And exactly. Very important. Yeah, they couldn't. They, you can't corrupt the Quran in its essence. You can't change the wordings and you can't, you know, fiddle around with putting one word from the beginning of the sentence to the end of the sentence. You can't do that with the Quran. It's protected. The essence of the Quran is protected by Allah himself. He never depended on people to protect his Quran. There's no such thing as people being the caretakers and the, and the uh, guardians over the Quran. Allah says in the Quran that he revealed it and he will preserve it. He will advance it, not us. Even what they did during the time of uh, the early Sahaba after the passing of the prophet. Right. When they, when all of the uh, the Hafiths, the people who had memorized the Quran by heart, were being killed in battle, imagine that. Imagine what I'm talking now in your in your mind's eye. Here you have a situation not long after the Prophet had died, because these are the same companions that were around him. Now all of a sudden, 
the people who had memorized the Quran, it was just a core group of them. Most of them were being murdered. Most of them were being killed at battle. You never ask yourself the question, who in the world were they fighting? I thought the prophet brought peace to Mecca. I thought he marched back in triumphantly and took it away from the Monafic and the Kafirs. And many of them became Muslims and some of them became just left. They didn't want nothing to do with it. They said, well, we'll live to fight another day. So who were these people they were battling that were so skilled at the battle that the Hafiz were beginning to disappear? And why the focus on the Hafiz? Out of all those people who must have been fighting, why are the Hafiz the ones who are dying in these numbers to the point where we better had collected this information and put it in a book and preserve it? They were fighting fellow Muslims. When the Munafik at war with them, they gave up. Allah says they have given up of ever being the leading forces in this land. See? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the Quran I'm giving you. So they were being killed by fellow Muslims. Why were fellow Muslims attacking these people? Because they began seeing them do things that went diamet diametrically opposed to what the prophet had ordered that they do. So they said, we're not going to let you corrupt. What was the first thing they did? They started calling themselves caliphs. The prophet didn't know anything about them being a caliph what they call a caliph now. Ain't no caliph. Stop using that term. My God, get rid of that. The caliph Ali, the caliph Abu Bakr, the caliph Caliph. This, Where is that in the Quran? Where is that even in the true sayings of the prophet? They, 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 they forced it into the hadith. But the only khalifa in the Quran is the one that Allah mentions twice as the khalifa that he was in the process of making. And also he mentions Daud as being a Khalifa. And then he mentions groups of people as being Khalifa, you get it? That word is never used to mean the companions or the Sahaba of Muhammad the prophet. So how did it get into our lexicon and why do we continue to use it? It's because you have placed your star in front of the moon, as I mentioned in this morning's, uh, I think it was this morning's lecture, the star and crescent. The star is right here, the crescent is right here. If that were real, and the moon were full, that would mean that the star would be in front of the moon if you can see it while it's in the proximity of that circle, even though the part of that circle that it's in is dark, you still know the whole moon is there. So they're showing you something from the beginning of their journey that is anti fitra Why are you still following it? Why are you still supporting it? Why is it still at the top of your masjid and on your clothing and in your earrings and pendants and all of that, star and crescent, star and crescent? You think that means Muslim, when in fact that means mushrik. That's what the pagan worshipers were boasting about. Stars and crescents, that's what the magicians were using. That's what the soothsayers were, were depicting on their clothing. That's what the Ku Klux Klan put on their cone-shaped hats to begin with, the star and the crescent. Then the Ottoman Empire came in, the last of the so-called Muslim empires, and they popularized that star and crescent. It had nothing to do with Al-Islam, nothing to do with the Quran, nothing to do with Muslims. It was popularized during the Crusades when certain innocent Muslims felt like we needed our own symbol to fight against the symbol of the cross, the dead man on the cross that they called Jesus. That was Suleiman. Pardon me? It was Suleiman. Where he, when they had to raise the cross, he point to the above. Uh, he put to the sky above, and they interpreted it as the stars and the crescent. I'm not sure how it happened. And it wasn't Suleiman. It was, uh, I forget, the leader of the Crusades at that time. He fought Richard the Lionhearted. I forget his name. Salahuddin. Yeah, Yes, that's great. That's correct. A courageous soldier, <laughs> a courageous and just soldier. Found out that the king that he was fighting against fell ill during the battle. Salahuddin snuck into his kingdom, snuck into his window. Since he was a physician, Salahuddin was a physician, he administered the cure for the king's illness. 
snuck back out of the window and found out that the king had gotten better and was ready to go back to battle. They went back to battle and Salahuddin kicked his butt. <laughs> well, you don't get no more courageous than that. That's our legacy on the battlefield, at least. But the point is, is that whoever instituted that star and crescent might have done it innocently, but the connivers and the language manipulators switched that crescent from the right side to the left side. And in doing so, see, I'm, I'm sure that the original Muslims who established that and sanctioned that said, we're the new kids on the block as Muslims, see? So we're the, we're the newly introduced light. That's the first, cre the first part of the crescent, see? That little fingernail you know, in the sky, that's, that's us. So we're coming from the right side and then we're going to wax full. We'll be a half moon, then we'll wax full as a moon and we'll be the complete light that Allah desired for this earth. I'm sure that's what they were thinking if they were innocent Muslims, but some sneaky conniving language manipulator came in and said, all we have to do, they won't even see us when we do it. We're just going to start making depictions of the star and crescent, but we're going to put the crescent on the left side, the waning side. The side. If we, yeah, if we just give it a couple of more days, that joker will be disappeared from the sky. <laughs> see? And, and then get the, the star will remain by itself. And the star represents us, the saints of the religion, the scholars in the religion, the holy man, all of us. We are the shining star. See? So they said the, the, pro the prophet was represented by the crescent. And the people were represented by the stars. But when they put that singular star in the middle of the crescent, in front of the crescent, they're saying our scholarship is now to be placed ahead of the prophet. The prophet said one thing, and they were going by what Allah put into the mouth of the prophet that we call the Quran. That's the prophet's words. I mean, straight from Allah. We're going to put our words in front of his words. In other words, if, if he says something, and we say something different, we're going, to, we're going to advance our message through a hadith, through a story, a narration, through a lie that we're going to tell. We're going to make it look like we are the go-to light for Muslims around the world. And they have succeeded. But guess what? That plan is unraveling so fast in our day and time, it would make your head spin to know how fast it's unraveling. And it ain't me doing it. I didn't start the, the ball rolling but I'm enjoying the ride because I'm an advocate for Al-Quran and the true Muslim life, which is the true human life, not the sectarian life, not the ethnic life, the true human life that makes what you do as a human equal to what I do as a human. And when I come with that human concern, I am advancing any, her, any human being that comes down my path. I don't say, oh, he's not one of us. Don't give him any money. Don't give him any zakat. Don't give him any whatever. Don't pray next to him. Don't meditate in his presence. Don't do anything because they're not like us. No, what do they even say Muhammad the prophet did? The Jews came to the masjid in Medina that he had helped to build. And they came for a weekend excursion of sorts. You know, they came for a sleepover. <laughs> yeah, they, went to, they brought their sleeping bags, the Jews and the Christians. They all came to the masjid in Medina. Medina is a very important point of interest for us. They had a sleepover. And the prophet didn't have any wild expect expectations about converting them to Al-Islam or anything. He just shared information. He said, well, give me your position and I'm going to teach you from the Quran. And they laughed together. They broke bread together. When it was time to go meditate or whatever they were going to do, the Jews did it the way they do it and the Muslims did it the way they did it. And the prophet didn't say, you can't do that in here. This is a sacred uh, masjid. Right. Pray in Hebrew in here. You can't do your hands like this and that and you know gesticulate and you can't do that here because that ain't what we do. Allah wipe that out. Don't you know that? You can't read no Torah in here. We got the Quran. You better listen to us or get the hell out of here. That's not what the prophet said. He was amicable. Once we really tap in, and this is what he meant, Muhammad was also trying to establish. He was trying to, to usher forth the correct way of envisioning the true life of Muhammad the prophet.
but he he has to he had to break through all of that crud to try and do it. So that's still our job. Study the Medina Charter. Most of you never even heard of it, have you? The Medina Charter. Just Google it. You might not be able to find it now because it's becoming such a popular read that a lot of the people who are conspiring against us being human have removed it. That is the most human doctrine, an agreement that he made in Medina between himself and the Christians and Jews, especially the Christians. He laid it out so perfectly upon the principle of la ikraha fidin, that there be no compulsion in, in the deen. That's the whole premise of the Medina Charter, whether it's real or validated or whatever. I'm still saying that that is a document to behold. Now, if we treat Christians like that Medina Charter encourages us to treat Christians and others, we'd be on top of the world again. If we treat them like these mullahs and these spoiler shakes and shakers are, treat, are teaching us to treat other people in from other deans, we're going to be messed up. We might be obliterated as a, as a real religion. We'll still be around here with all Allahu Akbar's and all that and our Juma Fridays. We'll still be here with that. But you'll be nothing more than a pagan sect. With your Juma, with your dhikr beads, with your thaws, with your turbans, with your chantings, with your adhan, with your gesticulations and movements and ritual bowing and putting your forehead on the ground, which Allah never says that's what sajda is putting your forehead on the ground to me. Allah never tells you to do that. He said that the angels did that to Adam. They said that. Yusuf said that the brothers of his and his mother and father made sajda to him. So how is sajda barring your forehead down on the ground to Allah? We never ask these questions because our minds have become too tainted with hadith that tell us that stuff. And we have put the star in front of the moon. That's what I call it from now on, putting the star in front of the, putting the scholars and what they say in front of what the prophet established as light for us to be guided by. So that's it on that. Anybody have any other questions, comments, or concerns? Thank you, Abdul, very good. I like that. Thank you, always. Okay, so if we don't, we're going to close out. And uh, I always enjoy these sessions. I hope you've been keeping up with the way I've been rolling them out. <laughs> like almost five every two days is a new video to behold. Even if you don't get a chance to watch them, save them into your computers or save them onto a hard drive, an independent hard drive. So if anything happens to your computer, you'll still have those lectures. They're becoming the talk of the town around the planet now. And I'm loving it. I am absolutely loving it. Does anyone have anything quick they want to say about these lectures that they've been hearing? Especially if you're just beginning to hear this information. Well, what I'll say, instructor, is that uh, I'm truly enjoying it. It's um, very enlightening. And uh, I mean, I, I'm enjoying it. And I'm enjoying your enjoyment. <laughs> I love to know that people are learning. It has nothing yeah. to do with my ego. It has to do with my we go. And I want we to go together to the, to the, to the, to the finish line. Yeah, but every now and then I have to know that you're understanding what I'm saying. I know I lay a lot on you. So I have to know that you're understanding what I'm saying. If I need to go slower on something or return to a particular subject that you think is important enough for us to um, repeat, then let me know that also. And if you don't do it online, it's not a problem. You can email me as you would do or uh, send me a text message or anything like that. And I appreciate all of the new people who have joined us. Thank you so much for your participation. So we'll give just a couple of more minutes for anybody else to chime in. Thank you, Wali Udain. And we need to talk. Salam alaikum. Alaikum salam. Where's your camera, man? <laughs> I'm waiting for you to, to get back with me. On, on, on my cookball, I, I think you stole some of my material. <laughs> you think so? <laughs> uh, <laughs> you I'm going to say to our audience that have received your cookball from me, the one who's stealing it from you, <laughs> I'm going to ask them to be the judge of who took from who. <laughs> but I will tell you this. I love when you borrow. 
from the language <laughs> of genetics. You one of the you one of the best that ever done it and got away with it, as we used to say. Right? Uh, so, like I what I'm you really saying that, that we are really uh, enamored for what you have done for us. Uh, uh, I couldn't imagine myself being where I am now from once I first came. Not mean I'm better than, but uh, that uh, that I'm. I understand where I need to go and what I need to do to continue. It's the repetition over and over and over again, and more things begin to open up. So uh, uh, may Allah continue to bless you. May Allah continue to bless us and rubbi zitni ilma and continue to increase us in knowledge. Amen. Inshallah. Thank you so much. And again, you guys, you might not know this person who just spoke, especially if you're new, but he's at the top of the list of classroom participants when it comes to understanding what is pneumatics and being able to explain it in a way that a grade schooler can understand it. So you're gonna be hearing a lot from him in the next few weeks. You're gonna be hearing a lot from several of you, maybe about 10 or so of you who I consider to be in that same class in the front row. And we're gonna really get this linguistic party started in terms of teaching pneumatics to the new people who are coming. All of the ones that I mentioned in that group of about 10 people are, right now qualified to teach in genetics, just a letter at a time. You see how I just taught on sod and meme today? Mm -hmm. By referring to the genetics book, that's all you have to do. Just go there, take the time and write down your own notes. You'd be surprised at what's waiting to escape from you like a seed and its ideation. If you would just give it your time and attention, it will expand for you. You won't have to do anything once you start concentrating on the word and the meanings that I put in the book is going to open up for itself and assist you. That's what angels do. Angels are not these flappy winged creatures flapping around in diapers waiting for God to tell it to do something. Angels are these frequencies and forces in nature that we've been discussing, the frequencies and the vibrations and the energy. We're not finished with this topic because I didn't touch on some of those other things, but that's what Allah's angels are. The one, same ones that make sense that in the direction of Adam talking about your command of the frequencies. Those are your malachic, your angels. The command of energy, like the scientists are doing. See? The commands of vibration, vibratory rates, knowing how to manipulate sound. Now you have it so that sound can heal people. You got sonogram that can show you the baby in the womb in full color. I went to my daughter's sonogram before she gave birth to our granddaughter, to my granddaughter. And you would have thought the baby was in the room, the clarity of the picture and the color. I had never seen a sonogram in color. I'm used to black and white. They have technology now to bring that baby right. They took a picture. <laughs> and the baby was in their full color. Oh, man, it's so beautiful what science has done. But those are the angels. The technology is a part of the angels that will make sense that to Adam. But if you're not coming in the mold and the form and the disposition of Adam, they ain't going to bother you. You're still pimping and hustling, you know, oh, and they, they, they don't come for you. They come for the ones who are paying attention to Allah's guidance. That's the purpose of Ramadan. Anyone else before we close? Assalamualaikum, instructor brother. Waalaikum salam, my brother. How are you? Alhamdulillah, doing well. Pray you're doing well also. Indeed. I've been keeping up with uh, your your meetings with other guests. Uh, I think it was Kamal and his wife. Yeah. That was an excellent session. Yeah. I mean, yes. uh, I learned a lot more, reinforced what you had been teaching us. But I had another question about the definition in genetics. And I know at first we referred to it as a linguistic science. Mm -hmm. And I know recently you referred to it as linguistic technology. Yes. Is there a, a difference? And what is that difference? I know it's a difference. Yeah, there, there, is. A change. there is. And it's a matter of understanding the words that I'm using. Linguistic science, you know, linguistic is connected to language. And language has to do with human communication in our case. The word science is from the shorter uh, word or um, uh, suffix 
S C I O C O, mm -hmm. sometimes pronounced as skio, because whenever you see this S C in an English word, it means to split. To split, like scissor. Mm -hmm. It's the same S C in scissor that is in science. And the reason for that is that the sciences are cut into different categories, biology, chemistry, see? Mm -hmm. Art sciences, soft sciences, see? So because sciences are split in that manner, it took on the name science. <clears throat> so linguistic science simply means that you can visit various fields of linguistics to support the contentions that the pneumatics is establishing. Like I do, I'll go to the Hebrew language. Sometimes I'll give you a Greek word. Sometimes I'll give you an English word, a Spanish word, maybe a word out of, uh, you know, Francais, you know, out of the French language, out of the ancient Egyptian language, see, to support the rationale that pneumatics is establishing. So that's what makes it a linguistic science. What makes it a linguistic technology is a little bit more interesting than that, in that the word technology comes from the prefix tech. T-E-C-H, but it's pronounced T-E-K. And it means hands, hands-on. Yeah. Yeah. When you touch something, see, touch and tech, T-E-C-H and T-O-U-C-H, it's the same word. And you touch things mostly with your hands. You tap, you touch. And what it is saying is that it is the action of one thing coming in contact with another thing, a second thing. So when I touch the wall or touch the pen, it's just the pen and me. And that's what I want Nunetics to be for you. Just you and Nunetics. Don't worry about mm -hmm. anybody else. You touch it. You touch it. You tap into it. Yes. Right. So, yeah. So tech means touch. Yeah. As Brett and Sirius yes. <laughs> is a tying together. That's why in Arabic, they call the thing that ties something together at the end of a word that makes it feminine. They call it ta marabuta. And marabuta, marabuta is from Arabata, which means to tie together. See? Because when you use Tata Marabuta, it's to tie the first word with the second word. So if I say Sunnah, that's one thing. But if I say Sunnah Tullah, that tu is a tab marabuta that ties the Sunnah with Allah. It's his Sunnah. The Sunnah separate, and then the Sunnah Tullah. Right? That tad marabuta is a tie that brings them together. So it's the same thing with the tech, the T, the cross. It brings two things together. Right? Latitude, longitude. Yeah. And the Veda said, wow. <laughs> if you turn that word around, you have to say it again. Wow. You understand? Yeah, this is wow. And it's not just wow for us because we never heard these things. Most people in the world have never heard these things. This is a new expression of language in the world. Not that it never existed, but I'm pretty much convinced that it never existed in a way that was able to be expressed like this. That's my gift. And I'm sharing that with you and I'm hearing it come from a lot of you now that you're able to articulate this. So all I'm doing is giving you the hints and the clues and better than that, I'm giving you the science for how to establish this language. Anywhere you go, you're going to be getting respect in this world Oh, from so many places, it's going to make your head spin in just a little while. When you get that call and I get that call and say, okay, uh, Saudi's ready to talk to you. Or the prime minister of some other country. Yeah, they want to have a, an audience with you. And my first question will be, can they come to where I am? Because I'm not going over there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can they come? Don't, aren't they rich enough to jump on a the plane? <laughs> they said they'll pay for your instructor. They, they'll fly you out to South Asia and they take your passport when you get there. I ain't going out there, no. They're taking my freedoms from me. If you don't like what I say, I might not make it back home. 
I'm, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not as. I'm not as courageous as Imam Muhammad when it comes to that. He went over there and he knew some of them didn't like him. <laughs> he cussed them out one time when he went there. Yeah. So no, I don't see myself as having them as my primary audience. My primary audience, like I said, is any true humor. But you're going to have to come to where I feel comfortable and we'll have that conversation. Okay. It's a beautiful day of opportunity for us. And I want you to register that. So that's the technology of Nunetics. It's designed to touch, to reach out and touch someone, like Diana Ross said, right? Reach out and touch somebody's hand. Make this world a better place if you can. Oh, I love that song. Yeah, I mean, Instructor, so, isn't it also have to do with, you know, touching and then causing some action to be generated so that you get from one thing to a next. Good point. Well, let me tell you what action happens immediately after you touch or have been touched. You ready for this, Winona? Yes. My resident genius learner. <laughs> she don't like me to say that in front of people. Anyway, this young lady here is brilliant. I know many of you are, but she, she had the nerve to call me and have private conversations with me. And I know how much genius is in her waiting to be let out. And it will. Now, I made. A, there was a point I made that I, I, I it just, I just lost it. Um, what was your last statement, Winona? What was your? Are last you statement? talking about generating act, action? Oh, yeah. Touching okay. something, yeah, generating yeah, yeah. action right. from one thing to another. I got it. Okay. As soon as you touch something or something touches you, it registers in your central nervous system. Mm. That's why everybody who signed on to this class tonight, I looked at the numbers, they have not fallen off by one. And I've been talking since 715 or so. It's because what I'm saying is touching you. You get it? And anytime anything, it could be a fly lighting down upon the hair on your arm, it touches you and it registers first and foremost in your central nervous system. That's how you know you've been touched. If your nerves haven't been affected, if you don't feel any way about it, it means you're insensitive to the touch. You're numb. <laughs> Somebody mentioned earlier, when you're numb, the spot in which you're numb is not going to register any sensation. So you have to design your language, your technology. You have to design your teach knowledge. You have to design your touch knowledge, your touch knowledge to affect people's central nervous system mm. so that that message will reverberate, another word for vibrate, a word we didn't get to today, but it's going to register a particular frequency level in that person that then is going to travel and start knocking on the door of the intellect to try to figure out what that feeling is. So you have to get people to first feel a certain way about what you're saying or about you. You have to be able to touch the sensitivities of people when you teach. You can't have teachers in the classroom teaching our young children, five years old, seven years old, 10 years old, who don't really feel good about the students that they're teaching. They're just doing it for the paycheck. You can't have teachers like that because you're going to have corrupted information entering into the brains of our young people. You have to bring in teachers who are qualified as touchers, not just teachers. Now, there are two kinds of touchers. One is a pedophile. You don't want that one. You want the ones who understand human sensitivity and how to touch the minds and touch the hearts and touch even the souls of those young people by introducing them to Allah's fitwa and causing their brains to be magnetized towards the information that's all around them. They can't wait to go outside at lunchtime or three o'clock when they're being dismissed to look at those things in nature that we were just discussing this morning in the classroom. That's what makes for a good teacher. You have to be able to touch the essential nervous system. Don't worry about the autonomic nervous system. It'll take care of itself. It's keeping everything in check within your system, especially in the gut. See? 
autonomic, instinctive, all of that is operating in the lower chambers beneath the torso. Worry about what's in the torso, the spiritual sensitivities, the emotional proclivities, the blood flowing through the heart, reconditioning the heart, reestablishing the purity of the blood through the four chambers and through the liver. And uh, study all of that as biology on your own. Just study all of that. Even if you study it, even if you have a degree in it already, the way I'm explaining it to you, when you go back, you're going to have a world of information, new information open up to you. That's touching. So I hope I was clear with that. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. Zaid, senior Zaid, uh, senior instructor Zaid Muhammad. Yeah, indeed. Uh, Are you in that word, uh, it up today. This is great. No, <laughs> the uh, the knowledge in there is also Malika. Explain. I understand what you mean. I want to make sure they understand. <laughs> well, yeah, you're lovely. I love you. The, the N, the yeah. N, the O, N, and the L, and the G. Mm -hmm. It's the M, L, and the K. Mm -hmm. so yeah. I'm saying as, as an angel mm -hmm. from the touch. Mm -hmm. I understand. Now, let me give it back to you like this. Mm -hmm. When you study language and the formations of words, you have to be very careful. <laughs> because sometimes you'll be seeing something that doesn't really exist. So I said to tech when I should have said tech no. Oh, yes, yes. So the N is actually a part of the first suff uh, part of the suffixes or the suff uh, right. part of the prefix. Right, right. The prefix is actually tech no mm -hmm. or tech with the N attached. And then ology is the suffix. And ology means what? It's a study of it. Oh, it's study. Right. Right. It's steady up. That's right. Now, let me tell you where they get that. Isolate out the consonants. What are they? In ology, there's only two. L and the G. That's right. What other English words can you get out of that L and G if you put different? Well, I, I already in see log in it. I see logic in it all. Logic. Log. About language. Language and no, leg. No. Just the LG. Just put a different vowel in the middle. Somebody said leg. 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 Yes. All right. Somebody said log. Yes, log and leg. Yeah. If we had to choose a longer word, we could say ligament. Leg, yeah. Okay. And legal. Legal. That's right. So all of those LG words are alluding to logic, as you said. And I knew Z was going to be on top of that. They're alluding to logic. Thank you, man. Yeah. So uh, somebody's phone is causing a lot of noise. So unless you're speaking, I'm going to ask that you mute your phone until you're ready to speak or if you have another question. All right. So the LG represents logic. And the human leg also represents logic symbolically. Imam Muhammad told us that he gave us that nugget. That the legs, the two legs are symbolic of the two logics called moral logic. And Moral and rational logic. That's right. And those are the two logics that human beings advance themselves forward on in the same way that an individual will advance themselves forward on their two legs. First, the left leg, followed by the right leg. The left leg is moral logic. You have to establish the rights and wrongs of a thing before you accept to go forward after that thing. Once the moral logic is established and you see that it's a decent thing to pursue, then the right leg is the rational logic that is now in a position to establish what you have agreed upon as moral logic. So you made a moral decision. You're going to do this for your family. You're going to do this for your family's financial future or whatever. Okay, now that you've decided upon the correct moral thing to do, now you have to put together a rational plan for getting it done. That's the left leg going forth. Like they tell you in the army, I was getting ready to say that when you march. We're see, psychic. you start on the left. Get on out. Get on out. That's right. That's right. See? So that's the progression. And the ancient Egyptians have that painted on the walls of their pyramids and other places. Man, where the man is standing, look at it. Go at Google ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs. 
And you're going to see the people, the man, the, 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 the bird head man, you know, the Ibis and all of that. You're going to see them with their legs spread, but their left leg is going to be out in front of their right leg most of the time. The only other thing you're going to see with the legs is that they're both kind of standing together. That's when they both have joined and they don't know which one should be taking the lead. But when that happens, you can't make an advancement. If you're still arguing about whether it's moral or whether I should implement it rash, if you're doing that and your legs are tied together like dead people, you're not going to make advancement forward. It's only when you let that left leg protrude and follow it with that right leg that you're going to make progress. That's what the ancient Egyptians were saying. And that's also what Allah is saying in the Quran, but he gives it to us in clear fitra based language. I won't get into that tonight. Ask me again in the next class when we have a Q&A. And I'll break that down for you. That this advancement in the legs is told in the Quran also through a word that means legs and feet. Now, if you know what that word is, I might give you a couple of minutes on it. If you don't, then we're going to move forward. Pardon me? I'm sorry. Roger. Say it again. Roger. That's correct. Ezekiel, master instructor. Yeah, he should be wearing the title senior instructor also, and he will. Several it's a others. soldier, right? It could be, yeah. They call it a foot soldier. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, but it's actually any male. Huh. Although that's not a complete description in and of itself, but that's how it's described by the male supremacist amongst the Arab-speaking people. <laughs> they wanted to make you think that when the Quran says, Arijal that is speaking about. Oh, uh, for the R, that's that R with the two legs. Oh, yeah. R. Yeah. yeah Rijal, okay. Yeah. And you know the J and the G are interchangeable, right? In linguistics. Mm -hmm. And you know that the R and the R are interchangeable, right? Mm -hmm. But Rijal already has an R, so just exchange that for the L. And then the J mm -hmm. is the G, and you have your LG all over again, but in a mm -hmm. different language. The AL on the end of Rijal is simply serving the purpose of a definite article. Mm -hmm. mm. That happens a lot in languages. The EL or the AL, like in Hebrew and Arabic, sometimes they just serve the purpose of, like Ezekiel, that's the perfect example. He just, he just uh, his name is just on the screen, right? That EL on the end of his name has a meaning. And in Hebrew, it's a, it's a way of saying the. It can be on the beginning of a word like Elohim, or it can be on the end of a word like Mikael and Ezekiel. So it's the same thing with Rijal. It's really the RJ that holds the meanings for that word. That's why a king in parts of India is called a Raja, no L. And he's the one that keeps the society focused and moving forward. The Raja, R-J, L-G, you see? The R becomes the L, the J becomes the G. So Raja is the same, same thing as leg, the one who is upholding the society. That's why they say, That's why they say that means that the men are the maintainers and supporters. That's what your legs do of the women. Wrong translation, but we'll get into that another day, right? The point is, is that Raja, Rijal, Rajala means those who travel by feet and by legs. So they say foot soldier, but Imam Muhammad corrected that for us. And he said that Rijal doesn't mean feet per se. It actually alludes to the legs. Now, let me ask you a quick question before we bow out. What's more important for your ability to move forward. You having legs and no feet, or you having feet <laughs> that are not connected to any legs? What more important for progress? Legs. 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 Yeah, legs and no feet, we know that. From the amputees, you don't, they don't cut off your legs and leave you holding your feet or in your back pocket, you get your feet carried around with you. So how can that word mean feet and foot soldier? 
Right. It means what Imam Muhammad said it means. It means legs. It's a sandal. It's a sandal. All right. So yeah. we hit it, and now we're going to quit it. I got to go. Thank you all for being with me. Keep crying. You see, Len? I thank you. And I'm, I'm happy and proud to be your teacher in charge. Thank Allah for you. And I'm happy and proud to have you as our teacher. It's my pleasure. Yes, ma'am. My pleasure. Thank you, sir. Thank you for being with us. One of those fourth angels. One of those fourth angels. Yes. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> we thank all of our guests who are still with us. <laughs> still. Thank you, brother. Yes. Ma'am. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay. It's my pleasure. Please continue to be with us. Okay. As I greet you with the greetings of peace that obligate each and every one of us to keep the peace. Salamu alaikum to you all. Walaikum salam. Salam alaikum. Walaikum salam. Love this. Walaikum salam.